tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Dave pulled up in front of his friend Ryan's trailer. He was glad for Ryan when he got land and got out of the trailer park, but now that he had to drive out here in the dark after a cryptic text message, he decided he would have preferred an active well-lit park. When he got out of the car, the bang of the shutting door rang out like a gunshot in the deafening silence of the North Carolina night. Now that he thought about it, it definitely felt way too quiet. This was off the beaten path, rural Carolina, and should have been full of animal sounds at all hours, not to mention the occasional person shouting and random gunshots, but there was nothing. The only sound was his own, the sounds Dave made, his boots crunching dry leaves as he headed to the wooden front porch. In a night where you could have heard a pin drop, it all felt violently loud. When he reached the top of the stairs, the curtain moved by the window. Dave could have sworn his childhood friend was watching him from inside. Why wouldn't he just open the door? He's the one that called and texted me. Dave knocked on the window in question rather than the door, and he jumped with a start at the thunderous snaps that echoed through the night when his knuckles rapped on the glass. The trailer's front door came open slowly. Dave sighed with relief, but it ebbed when he saw Ryan standing in the doorway, staring at him like he didn't really see him. Did he see something else? What are you looking at, buddy? Hello? Hey, Dave said, doing his best to smile. I was beginning to think you weren't home. It's so dark and quiet out here. A little creepy, really. I got your messages, but I had to run to the store first. I was out of coffee. You know how I am with my coffee. Ryan, you there? Dave looked at his friend curiously. It was clear that Ryan wasn't listening to him at all, but the way his eyes moved and his head turned, it seemed like he was definitely listening to something. He didn't seem to realize Dave was there, standing on his porch, not three feet in front of him. Ryan, Dave shouted, moving his hand back and forth in front of his friend's face. Where the hell are you right now? Ryan blinked repeatedly and finally seemed to notice Dave standing in front of him. Hey, come in, he said glumly, his voice a strange monotone. Quickly. Dave watched Ryan's eyes dart back and forth, nervously surveying the night. He rolled his own shoulders, trying to play off the chill of fear that he felt. He couldn't get in that house fast enough, but he tried to seem casual about it. His host paid another long look outside before judging it safe enough to close the door. You want to tell me what the hell's going on? Dave asked when the door shut. Ryan turned and looked at him. His eyes were grim, bloodshot, and hovering above dark bags. The once outgoing, boisterous man had become aloof and distant seemingly overnight. It wasn't a week ago. Dave was sharing laughs with him at a poker party. They had known each other since Ryan moved down from Raleigh in elementary school and been friends for most of it. Through all those years, Ryan had never been the quiet one. Not ever. You want something to drink? Ryan asked, heading through the kitchen to a cabinet above the sink. With a sigh, Dave said, Sure, I'll have whatever you're having. I haven't seen you in days, Ryan. What's up, man? Talk to me. Your messages were a little cryptic, bro. Ryan pulled a bottle of whiskey out of the cupboard. He retrieved two glasses from the next cabinet over and poured the drinks without responding. Dave watched his friend's trembling hands working to keep the brown liquor from dousing the countertop. He sighed with frustration and took a seat at the nearby table. He'll fill me in. Just give him time to collect himself. Something is obviously really wrong. Ryan moved in a slow, lethargic fashion as he put the alcohol back where he got it from. Lifting the glasses from the counter, he walked to the table. Dave's patience was waning. His friend's gaze was still somewhere else. Was he remembering something? He still looked like he was listening to something, but there was no sound. Dave had never known quiet like this, even inside the trailer. There was no music, no television. Each sound Ryan made stood out awkwardly. Dave watched the liquor move in the glasses that Ryan carried and occasionally splash over the side. His friend didn't even seem to notice. 
There was a time when Ryan would have referred to such a thing as alcohol abuse had he seen someone else carrying drinks so carelessly. What's happened to him? Did someone die or something? Taking a seat across from Dave, Ryan placed the drinks on the tabletop. Dave reached over and took the one poured for him. The way this night was going, he wished that Ryan had just brought the bottle. Tell me what's going on, man. I'm here for you. You know that. You're my boy. What's got you fucked up? Ryan nodded. His tongue emerged to lick at cracked sandpaper lips. He grabbed his drink and tossed back a gulp big enough to make Dave cringe. It's out there, he said in that same monotone as he placed the glass back on the table. His hands were so shaky, unsteady. How much had he been drinking? Dave had a small sip of his own drink and took a deep breath, reveling in the warmth that flooded his chest. What is it, man? I wear. I don't understand. Ryan stared into Dave's eyes with a sudden intensity. The seriousness of his gaze made Dave squirm a bit. He quickly took another sip of his drink. I wish I knew what it was, Ryan said. What it wanted. I wish I could explain it better. I can't. I'm not sure I follow, man. Is it some kind of animal? I think you've definitely moved into bear country. Ryan shook his head. No, no, nothing like that. I wish it was a bear. I, I know how to handle bears. I don't know. It's just, you know how you can feel when someone is staring at you? How it makes your skin crawl? How even when you can't see who's staring, the feeling itself attaches to you like something physical, like an itch? How it's a feeling that is almost tangible that you can't shake and it starts to drive you crazy? Dave looked over his shoulder after Ryan's description of the sensation. Um, yeah, sure, of course. Everyone knows that feeling, Ryan. What are you getting at? You saying someone is stalking you? Ryan's fingertips toyed with this double. I feel it all the time. It doesn't matter where I am. If I'm outside or by a window, it's there. I can feel it watching me. I can feel its hunger. I can hear it creeping along, crunching leaves, breathing, panting, whispering my name, singing even. It's outside my house somewhere, everywhere. I don't know. Ryan's hand went tightly over his mouth then, and he choked back a sob. Tears rose up to wet his bloodshot eyes. Dave rubbed his forehead and bit his lip. Finally, he said, Have you been feeling okay, Ryan? You didn't take something, did you? If you did, you need to be honest with me so I know how to help you, man. I'm not going to judge you. I just want you to be okay. No! Ryan slammed his palm down on the table. The boom made Dave jump and spill his drink on his shirt. Shit! What the hell, Ryan? Ryan took several quick breaths, his shoulders raising and lowering. He lowered his head then and put his hands over his face. When he spoke, it was quiet and reserved again. You think I'm nuts? I'm not nuts, Dave. You think I'm on drugs? I literally wish I was on drugs. I can say that to you. That's why I didn't call anyone else. I called you. I called you because I can trust you. Now I need you to trust me. If you listen, really listen, you can hear it out there. Just listen. Please, hear it for yourself. Dave downed what was left of his drink. I do trust you, he said as he got up to retrieve the whiskey bottle. He cringed at the squeal of the chair legs on the linoleum tiles. I always have. Look, you just texted and called and said you needed me, and I came, right? He grabbed the bottle from the cabinet, carried it back to the table, and quickly refilled both glasses. What do you hear, Ryan? What does it sound like? Listen, you will hear it yourself. Just listen. After a few seconds of silence, Dave sighed. He shrugged his shoulders and sipped his drink. All right, man. What am I supposed to be hearing? I don't hear anything, Ryan. 
I want to support you, bud, but I don't even hear the normal sounds. It's creepily quiet out here tonight. Ryan slammed his hand down hard on the kitchen table, making alcohol splash from the freshly filled glass before him. You're not really listening, he snapped. Dave's heart jumped at his friend's outburst. Damn it. Stop doing that, okay? Shit, fine. I'll listen, okay? Tell me what to do. You gotta be completely silent. Don't even breathe. Hold your breath. Don't move. Just listen. Listen hard like you're looking for someone that's hiding from you. You know what I mean, right? Like when you're playing hide and seek and you know they're there somewhere, but they're trying to be quiet because... They don't want to be found, so you listen really intently to catch the slightest thing like they're breathing or moving or something. Yeah, I got it. Dave took a deep breath and another sip of whiskey. He swallowed a lump in his throat. Okay, let's listen. He did as Ryan said and held his breath, straining to hear any sound that might still be there in the thick silence. His heart quickened its pace and his held breath escaped him when he actually heard it. Dave stared across the table at Ryan, who met his gaze and nodded. See? You heard it, didn't you? Ryan said. It's real. And it's out there. It's so subtle, Dave said, shaking off the chill of the phantom fingers that traced the contours of his spine. It sounds like someone breathing, like papers being shuffled, boots crushing leaves, knuckles cracking, nails scraping glass, I don't know. It's fucking weird. How long has this been going on? Three days. Dave stood up. He didn't care about the volume of his chair scrape anymore. That's ridiculous, man. Come on. We're going out there. If someone is out there, we'll find them together. No more games. Sit down, Ryan told him. It's dark out there. What are you going to see? Dave tilted his head and looks at his friend like he was crazy. You've got a flashlight, don't you? If you don't, I've got one in the car. You can't live like this. Let whoever is fucking with you have power like this. We'll drag them out and make them explain themselves. No, just sit down, okay? Ryan's words were laced with fear. He scratched at the back of his neck. No. Dave turned his back and headed towards the door. You can't go on like this, he said. If some freak is hiding out there... I'm going to find him and kick his ass. Three days. This is crazy. Stop! Ryan screamed. Dave turned and looked back. Ryan stood from his seat. He was trembling so badly that he almost fell. Don't you think I tried, Dave? I went out there on the first day, damn it. I looked for hours. Hours. I found nothing. But I felt it staring at me the whole friggin' time, watching me. I could hear it breathing, even feel its breath in my skin giving me goosebumps. I could hear it whispering to me, but I couldn't make out what it was saying. It was nowhere and everywhere, all at once. I knew it wanted me, but it was waiting for some reason. I don't know what for, but the point is, I never found it, but it always found me. You won't find it either, Dave, because it doesn't want to be found. Have you called the police? Ryan took a step towards him on unsteady legs. And say what exactly? And even if I managed to get them to come out, what good would it do? They would come out here and find nothing. They would just think I was crazy or on drugs too. You know I'm right. Dave sighed. You're right. He didn't say, but they might be right too. He did his best to massage some of the tension from his forehead. All right, then, he said. Let's get out of here. You can come crash my place for a bit. Ryan shook his head. He turned and walked into the living room. Dave reluctantly followed. Come on, get your stuff, he said as Ryan all but fell onto the couch. I can't, Ryan told him. He wiped fresh tears from his eyes. It won't let me leave. Don't ask me how I know. I just know, okay? I can feel it. It wants something, needs something, but I don't know what. It isn't going to let me leave before it gets what it wants, whatever that is. I wish I knew. 
I would give it whatever it wanted just to make this end. I can't take it anymore. His eyes roamed around the room following the fluttering notes of sound that reached out to him like icy fingertips. Dave knew because he could hear them too now. He wished he couldn't. He wished he could go back to the silence that blanketed him when he arrived. But there was no going back now. Dave squeezes his hands into tight fists. He was growing quickly frustrated with the whole situation and the sound of that thing breathing in his ear was nerve-wracking to say the least. Well, what do you want me to do? We can't just sit around and go crazy, Ryan. Ryan cast his eyes toward the floor, quickly averting his gaze. I don't know. I was just afraid, I guess. I didn't want to be alone. I don't know. Maybe you can help me figure out what it wants from me? Dave grumbled but said nothing. He walked over to the couch and took a seat next to his friend. Putting a hand on Ryan's shoulder, he said, All right, man. Don't worry about it. It's cool. I'm here. Let's click the TV on, huh? Let's see if we can't find something to lighten the mood. At least maybe it will drown out the sound some. Then we can talk and see what we can figure out. Ryan nodded. He closed his eyes and took a slow, deep breath. When he opened his eyes, he seemed slightly more relaxed. The remote is next to you. I'm going to run inside and get my drink. You want yours? Yeah, sure, thanks. Dave said as he located the remote control. Pointing it, he clicked on the television and started flipping through channels. When Ryan left, he hit the mute button. Dave wanted to make sure he could hear Ryan in the kitchen. He frowned at himself, realizing at once that his friend's paranoia was rubbing off on him. But it wasn't paranoia if someone was really trying to get you, right? Dave could hear it, even now, chanting in whispers, scraping at the paint on the walls, clicking its tongue. It sounded like it was in there, walking around the room, but the feet were stepping on dry leaves instead of the dull gray carpet. Dave felt suddenly afraid, nervous. He wanted to drown out the sound. He moved to turn the volume back on when the sound of shattering glass made him jump out of his skin and drop the remote to the floor, cussing under his breath. Ryan? What the hell was that? You okay? Ryan? When no response came, Dave jumped quickly from the couch. He raced towards the kitchen, prepared for confrontation. He didn't know what to expect, what the owner of such sounds would look like. His heart pounded in his chest and chills danced their way up and down him. Stopping outside the kitchen doorway, Dave grabbed one of Ryan's old football trophies off a nearby shelf, knocking down a framed photo of the championship team in the process. It's not the best weapon, but it will have to do. I will not go down without swinging something. Dave didn't see anything, but he couldn't stop hearing it. It sounded like whispering and a breeze whipping through trees, crunching brittle leaves and heavy labored breathing, scratching nails on glass, squealing shuffling feet like those of a shackled prisoner, and then the faint quiet notes of an eerily beautiful song. They sounded so far away, but also like they were all around him. Dave didn't know what was real anymore. Ryan? His hands were shaking and he found it hard to breathe, like the air was thick, sludgy. He uselessly told himself to stay calm. Then he stepped over the threshold into the kitchen, and Ryan wasn't there. Whatever he was expecting to find, to fight, it wasn't there either. Dave was just alone, alone with the incessant sounds of whatever was out there, stalking them. He took another step into the room, and another. Something crunched under his foot, and he gasped. Were the leaves really in the house now? Dave looked down and saw broken glass and spilled liquor on the floor at his feet. The leaves were only in his ears, but the relief of that knowledge was fleeting. The broken glass meant that something did happen to Ryan. Where the hell was he? Dave looked up quickly because he could feel someone watching him. He couldn't see them any more than he could Ryan, but he knew they were there. The whispers returned on the whistling wind. He could feel hot breath on his arm, the back of his neck. Moving in a circle, glass crunching under his boots, Dave looked all around the room, but there was nothing to see. It could only be heard, felt. It made him feel dirty, crazy, in need of a shower, fresh clothes. He had never been so frightened in his life. 
he was suddenly overwhelmingly alone. Ryan, he called out, hearing the fear in his own voice. The only response was a soft whistle. Dave's head whipped around. He still saw nothing and found himself trembling like Ryan had been. How had his friend survived days of this? Dave's stomach twisted in knots. Nausea worked its way up his system. He puts a hand over his mouth. Then, he noticed it. The window above the sink was open, thin yellow curtains blowing inward. The whistling he had heard was the wind, the actual wind. Dave laughed. It was comforting that it was something real, something he could make sense out of. Did Ryan go out the window? Did he climb out, or did something pull him out? Did whatever was out there drag him off into the unnaturally dark night? It happened so fast. There was no scream, no struggle. Just the glass breaking, and then nothing. Holding his breath, Dave approaches the window. Leaning slightly, he tried to see outside, to spy Ryan or whatever had taken him. The darkness was total, complete. Everything looked the same. Dave put his finger in his mouth and bit down on it. If something really did take Ryan, and in a blink like that, then there was no way he could chance running out to the car for his flashlight. He would never make it. It's not gone. I can hear it whispering to me. Feel the moisture of its breath wetting my cheek, but it won't kill me. Not yet. It wants something. But what? Dave could feel it staring at him, through him, eyes roaming over his form like molesting hands. What do you want? He growled. Just tell me what you want. The hairs on the back of his neck stood up. Dave could feel those phantom eyes piercing his back no matter which way he turned. Somehow, they were always behind him. There was a sound right by his ear like a tongue lapping up water. The cacophony of whispering voices fluttered around his ears like the buzzing of mating insects. Was it in the house or outside? Maybe it never left. Maybe it consumed Ryan and stayed hidden somewhere, waiting for him. Dave whipped around in a hurry to find that the eyes still remained behind him. That's crazy. I'm going mad. This whole thing is mad. Where the fuck is Ryan? Dave stood as perfectly still as his shaking nervous limbs would allow. He could hear those damned leaves crunching under heavy footfalls. The whistling wind drew him back to the open window. He shot across the room and slammed it shut frantically. Panting, he fumbled with the lock, but he knew in his heart that wouldn't keep it out. Whatever was out there, if it wanted him, it would get him, just like it did Ryan. It just didn't want him yet. It was waiting for something, but what? The wondering and not knowing anything was driving him insane. Dave paced the kitchen. He chewed the nails off every finger on his hand. He was going to die here, and no one would know. He had to call someone for help. But who could he call for something like this? Ryan was right. The police would laugh at him or lock him up, maybe even blame him for Ryan's disappearance. If he was going to call anyone, it had to be someone he could trust. Dad. Dad would believe me. We've been through everything together. He'll come, and he'll listen. Dave ran out of the kitchen. He had to find Ryan's phone. He had left his own sitting in the cup holder of his car's dash in along with the flashlight in his glove box, both completely useless to him. He couldn't go out there. It was out there. Ryan's phone was the only chance he had. Now that he's heard the thing that watched, heard it clearly, he couldn't unhear it. He had opened a door that couldn't be closed. The hairs on his neck and arms were standing on end like there was static electricity. It could be anywhere, and he had no idea how much time he had before it came to take him. Would it give him days like it did Ryan, or would it be hungrier now that it had a taste? Dave wasn't hopeful. He scrambled around the house in a panic, searching, tossing things over his shoulder with loud bangs and clangs. He looked on every table, every shelf, under the cushions, on the couch, in the dresser, and the hamper, the cupboards, the bathroom. When he came up empty, he started to get hysterical. 
Dave told himself to stay calm, but it wasn't working. He tried to listen for the phone the same way he listened for it. Maybe the volume was off, but he would hear it buzz from under something if he listened well enough. No one had to be calling. Ryan had a thousand apps that gave regular notifications. It was bound to chime if he was patient. What if Ryan had the phone in his pocket? Then I'm screwed. I'm going to die here. I don't want to die. I can't give up. Dave stood poised between the rooms. He didn't move or even breathe. He just listened. The sound of the phone never reached his ears. He just heard it. It was out there, breathing, watching him, calling to him in its own way. It almost sounded like a song, a song sung too far away for him to make out the words, yet he still knew they were for him. He could feel it within him, touching the core of his being in a filthy, unwanted sexual way. His skin was crawling. What do you want? He said shakily with tears in his eyes. What do you want from me? Dave snapped back to reality when he heard the chime of Ryan's phone coming from the kitchen. He lets out a big exhale and thanked God. Then he ran. Dave followed the sound and found himself standing beside the round table facing an open front door. No! Wind whipped through the door carrying the whispers and crunching leaves with it. The song of death, he decided. How did it get in? Dave heard the chime again and he realized the phone was laying at the foot of the open door. He swallowed a lump in his throat. How was this possible? Was it tempting him with it? Could it be giving the phone back, toying with him? Dave shook furiously as he approached the open door, moaning wind and grinding teeth blowing at him from the darkness, scratching nails and heavy footfalls, lapping tongues and salivating hunger. Dave prayed to God. He bent slowly, his head still up, gaze upon the blanket of blackness that covered the house. Looking up and out, his eyes like moths at a light, he reached down blindly and felt around for it. When his hand came over the phone, he grabbed it quickly, afraid to have his guard down any longer. The staring eyes were penetrating him like knives of darkness. Dave gasped and dove backwards into the house, kicking the door closed. He sat there trembling on Ryan's kitchen floor, panting and staring at that door in wild terror. Dave felt like something was touching his back, gently caressing it, and he cried out, rolling and jumping away from the sensation. Had something snuck through the open door and come in with him? Was this how it got Ryan? Of course, there was nothing to be seen, only felt and heard. There was a tapping at the window. Dave knew there was no tree on the other side, nothing to make such a sound, yet it continued like drummer fingers on the glass. He couldn't help but look, but just as he knew he would, he saw nothing. How did Ryan live like this for three days? Dave felt like he would go insane long before that. He left the kitchen to put distance between himself and that window. With the phone in his hand, Dave started to pace the living room. He dialed his dad. His heart pounded in his chest while he listened to the ringing in one ear and the whispers in the other. Pick up, pick up, he chanted the words like a mantra. Pick up, pick up. Hello, his dad's voice answered. Dad, Dave cried, you know where Ryan lives? I haven't been to the new place yet. Is something wrong? What's going on? Dave bit his lip. He looked around the room. He tapped his foot nervously and struggles to fight the urge to break into sobs. I'll send the location to your phone. You can GPS it, Dad. Can can you please come here? Like, right away? I'll explain it all when you get here, okay? Just come, quickly. The whispers, the faint touch, the rhythmic breathing, the crunching leaves, a rising crescendo of erratic moans followed by snarling dogs. Dave bit down on his fist. Sure, David, I'll come. But what's going on? Dad, please! The incessant sound of crunching leaves, the song dancing around him, touching him like the lightest legs of insects. Okay, okay, son. I'll be right over there, okay? Just sit tight. Send me the location. Yeah, bye, Dad. Dave hung up the phone. He quickly did as he said he would and sent his father the location. He would be safe soon. 
his dad would know what to do. Now it was just a waiting game. Dave had to hope it left him alive long enough for his dad to get there. He knows it was waiting for something, and now he was waiting for something too. He only hoped they were not the same thing. Dave prayed for his father to get there and make it inside the house safely. He was too anxious to breathe. He began to pace again, unable to settle down and steady himself. His fingers fidgeted, his foot tapped. The eyes were everywhere, the sounds constant. It feels personal somehow, violating. Dave felt like he was losing it. What happened to Ryan? What's going to happen to him? Was it death that awaited him in the darkness or something else, something worse? Did he just say his name or was it his imagination? It definitely sounded like it knew his name. There it is again. Why can I understand it now? What has changed? Then there was a knock at the door. Dave rushed over in a hurry. He moved with urgency, panic racing through him, his heart in his throat. He moved the curtain to peer out the window beside the door. His dad was standing outside on the porch. Thank God. Oh, thank you, God. Dave knew he could trust his dad. He ripped the door open in a hurry. The voices were singing and whispering and breathing heavily all at the same time, a chorus of the damned. How many were there? Maybe there was an army of evil things out there. David, I'm here. Tell me what's going on, his dad said. Where's Ryan? David? Dave wasn't paying attention. He was staring past his father into the dark night beyond. He was listening. David! His dad shouted, waving his hand in front of his son's face. Dave finally looks his father's way. Come here, quickly, he said. His dad moves past him into the house. Dave gave one last look out into the darkness and then shut the door with a shiver, his nervously fidgeting fingers going to his mouth. You want something to drink? You might need it with what I'm about to tell you. No, David, I want you to tell me what's going on. I'm going to have something to drink, Dave answered. He poured liquor into the glass he had been using and sat at the table. His father followed and sat across from him. Dave's gaze followed him as he craned his head when he noticed the broken glass on the floor. What is this? He asked. Did something happen to Ryan? David, what's going on? Dave twitched his head and tapped at his ear, but the crunching leaves and whistling wind still nagged at him with their distant song. It never ceased. It never fucking stops. Please, stop. His dad sighed, obviously growing frustrated and annoyed. Can you tell me what's going on now, David? I can't help you if you don't talk to me. The endless breathing, the piercing stares, the damned dry, brittle leaves. Dave took a big gulp from his drink. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and placed the glass back on the table. Then he met his father's eyes. His dad shivered when he met Dave's intense stare. It's out there, Dave said. It's watching listening, and it never shuts up. His dad shook his head. His hand pulled at his face. What is out there, David? Out where? I don't know. Somewhere. Everywhere. Just listen. Really listen. Don't breathe. Don't think. Just listen. Okay? Please. How could he not have heard it before Ryan made him focus? How could anyone not hear it? It's so constant and penetrating. An assault. Maybe it's always there, but you don't know until you open yourself up to it. His father frowned. I don't hear anything, David, he said sympathetically. Dave knew it was there. He could feel it, hear it moving, breathing, whispering to him, licking the inside of his ear. That's because you're not really listening. Not the way I asked you to. Block out everything and just listen. His father sighed with frustration but nodded. Okay, he said. Then he closed his eyes and sat there across from Dave. He was so still, his eyes fluttering beneath closed lids. Then they flicked open and went wide. He stared at his son intensely and Dave nodded because he knew 
his father had heard it. What is it? I don't know, but it took Ryan. I'll be right back. Stay right there. Don't move. Dave ran to the bathroom. He glanced at the window just long enough to be sure it was closed and locked. Then he doubled over and vomited into the toilet. Once his stomach was empty, he turned the sink on full blast and rinsed his mouth, splashing water on his face as well. Then he heard it. The thing's approval. It was happy with him. He knew at once what it wanted. It was waiting for him to call someone else to keep the chain going. Ryan's three days had been a gift because he endured them alone before calling Dave. Dad! Dave had to warn his father to tell him not to call anyone, no matter what happened. He shut the water off and turned towards the door in a hurry, but he felt wind on his back and gasped, knowing the closed window was now open. Dave made to scream for his father, but something covered his mouth. Then he was dragged away into the darkness without so much as a sound. His father in the other room, waiting for him to return. I knew it would be a bad day when the lawnmower crashed into a headstone. I hadn't seen it because of the multitude of weeds covering it, but it's hardly an excuse. The old groundskeeper, the one I was being trained to take over for, had told me there was no reason to take care of this part of the cemetery. It was so old, the people buried there were two generations or more dead. But I'd already finished taking care of the rest of the graveyard, I figured there was no harm in putting in a little more work. The lawnmower sputtered before it died, a sort of I told you so before it was done. I hopped off the mower and pushed it away to check out the worst of the damage on the headstone. If it wasn't too bad, I planned to put the mower away and pretend it never happened. If the old keeper asked why the lawnmower didn't work anymore, I'd claim I didn't know. I tore away the remaining weeds to find that the headstone was not what it should have been. The stone was nearly entirely smooth with no birth or death date. The only word on it had been mostly worn away by time. All I could make out was A-F-R. On second look, I realized I'd bumped the headstone hard enough that it moved and the spot it covered was a hole in the ground. With some more shoving, I moved the headstone far enough to see that the hole was a set of winding stairs going down into the ground and so dark, I couldn't see the bottom. I ignored the initial impulse to move the headstone back into place and finish up my workday, instead going for my second thought. I started down those mystery steps. Could this be another area for storage, or a secret passage into a locked mausoleum? Curiosity had a reputation for killing cats, but I was only going down for a quick peek. The steps curved down, the walls turning from sod to stone, the hot sun vanishing after I went down what I presume was a few flights. It was cool down here and so quiet I could hear my heartbeat in my ears. I'm not sure how long I walked, but likely no more than 10, 15 minutes down those steps. It got so dark I had to get my phone out to serve as a flashlight, and I was nearly out of breath by the time I reached the bottom. My new theory was that this was a ruin, something historical that had gone unnoticed. I shone my phone around and spotted a lantern on the wall leading to a winding corridor. I looked back up the steps, resolved to turn back later once I did a little more exploration, and then I picked up the lantern and tried to light it. I was pleasantly surprised that the lantern lit. It would save my phone's battery at least. I may have given up smoking, but I'd still kept the lighter in my pocket. Down the path I went, my feet took steps in a place that had not been entered for decades, maybe even a century or more. 
I was so curious I wasn't even afraid. The stone brick walls reminded me of ancient castles, and with the lantern in my hand, I felt like an explorer or archaeologist. The excitement pumping through my veins made me press onward. The path never took a hard left or right. It curved slowly, not enough that I could notice, but enough that soon the exit behind me was no longer visible. I didn't need to go back to the exit, though. I wanted to see what was ahead of me. I finally came upon an intersection of paths, seven in total, all bending and going in different directions. Disappointingly, two paths were caved in, so I couldn't go down them. I chose the path most to the right and headed down it, but it didn't go far. It ended after a few steps, old bookshelves leaning and collapsing on each other and the stone walls behind them. I picked up one of the books to examine it. It was crudely bound with a reddish leather, and when I flipped it open, I couldn't make heads or tails of the words inside. It wasn't even using an alphabet I'd ever seen in my life. Not that I made a habit of learning all the different letters. I tucked it into my jacket before heading to the other tunnels. Now, I picked the next one at random, heading down it to find it went on much farther than the one that went to the books. It wasn't longer than the tunnel I'd entered, though, and it soon opened up into a new room. I realized that the lanterns in this room were already lit, which certainly made me pause. The second was the amber. I lowered my lantern and hesitantly approached one. It was well kept with no dust or chips, but it still took me a second to realize what was inside it. I suppose it was amber anyway, I can't be sure, but larger amber stones about as tall as I am dotted the room in no particular order or fashion. It was a person, a, a woman wearing a dress that made her look like she was from the late 1800s. But she was so perfectly preserved in the amber that she almost still looked alive, her eyes wide and staring back at me. My hand shook as I tried to grab my phone from my pocket to take a photo, and I dropped it to the ground. I heard the scream crack when it hit the stone, and without taking my eyes away from the figure frozen in amber in front of me, I knelt down in an attempt to scoop it up. The only reason I looked away from the corpse was that I heard someone. For a split second, I thought it was her, no, she was as still as she had been when I first entered the room. No, that sound came from the other side of the room. I wasn't alone. In a panic, I crawled away, watching through the amber as a... A person? W was it a person? I couldn't be sure. I, I couldn't see it clearly, but I watched something exit the room through the tunnel I entered. They didn't seem to pause or indicate they knew I was there, but I wasn't excited to be down here anymore. Not among the people frozen in amber gravestones or the strangers walking around down here. I needed to go. I didn't even pause to grab my phone. I just headed for the tunnel I came into. I didn't see the figure down the way, so I assumed they were far enough ahead that I could slip out before they even realized I was there. I took one step into the tunnel when that person swung down from the ceiling, hanging upside down, its grin showing off its mouthful of knife-like teeth. It wasn't a human, or if it had been, it wasn't anymore. Its arms and legs were too long, and its body wrapped tightly in its white, leathery skin. Its eyes were the size of golf balls, white as the rest of it, but they were looking at me. It saw me. It waved at me. It waved its clawed hand at me before taking a swipe. I barely ducked back in time to avoid having my face ripped off before I spun around and bolted for the other tunnel that led out of the room. 
The creature shrieked behind me and laughed like I'd told a hell of a joke before I started running for my life. I didn't look back at it. I didn't know if it was chasing me or if it was still hanging from the tunnel ceiling, watching me go. I just kept running until I couldn't hear the laughter anymore. Running like hell at least got me away from that thing, but now I had no idea where I was. The tunnel split in what felt like a hundred different places, and I didn't take note of which ways I'd gone in my frantic panic. I was lost. The instinct to just lay on the floor and curl into a ball was strong, but I knew I couldn't do that. I didn't even want to consider what kind of horrid fate would await me. After all, no one knew I'd gone down here. And if that thing caught up with me... So I pulled myself off the ground and started walking forward. Perhaps there was another exit if I kept going. Maybe a trap door that would lead back to the surface. I didn't have my phone anymore. I'd left it behind in the room of Amber Graves. I doubted I would have a signal this far below ground, but perhaps I would get lucky. I walked for what felt like ages. I'd take short breaks to catch my breath, but not long. I was too afraid of that thing catching up to me and... Well, God knows what it would do to me with those claws. I didn't know if I was relieved or terrified when I saw the light up ahead. I knew I hadn't gone any significant amount up, but the path ahead was the only one I could take. So I headed for the light. The cavernous room was lit by the same lanterns I'd seen down here, but I wasn't the only person. That wasn't comforting for long, though, when one of them looked in my direction. His eyelids were sewn shut over his hollow eye sockets. He was completely expressionless, probably only looking up in an instinctive response to my footsteps, and he soon resumed his task at hand, which was to crack open the coffin in front of him. This place was filled with coffins, some still shut, most busted open with little care. All with their eyes sewn shut, other people were dragging the corpses out of their supposed final resting place and hauling them over to the tables. Some bodies were still fresh enough, others were leaking and rotting. One body fell to the ground after its skin just sloughed off in the hands of the person carrying it. This didn't seem to bother the grave robber. He just grabbed the corpse by the other arm and continued dragging it down a dark hall. The living people didn't acknowledge me. A few even bumped into me as I passed, but they didn't so much as flinch or react. They just continued their grave robbing. I didn't bother trying to speak with them. I feel it would have either scared them out of their minds or they wouldn't acknowledge me. This room was connected to one I can only describe as an ancient throne room decorated for a children's birthday party. The throne at the head of the room appeared old, with a skeleton sitting in it but it had a plastic crown sitting crookedly on its skull, and paper streamers were draped over its shoulders. On its lap sat a rotting head, a party hat laying next to it that was probably once on that head. More streamers laid on the floor and dangled from the walls, wrapping paper decorating bones and dead rats. It was so awful and strange, I didn't stay long. Turning to go only for my way to be blocked by that creature from before. I don't know how long it had been standing in the doorway, but I knew it was waiting for me to notice it. It gestured to me almost like it was telling me to wait. 
I felt frozen as it reached behind the wall and yanked out one of those eyeless people. He obediently followed the monster as it dragged him along, not resisting it. The monster pulled the guy over to the throne before it stopped. It waved its claws at me, smiling from ear to ear. Then, those claws slashed open that guy's neck. Blood poured down his ragged shirt, and he only gurgled before slumping forward, leaning against the monster that killed him. The monster slashed its claws repeatedly until it had entirely severed that man's head. The body lay in a bloody pool while the monster carried the new head over to the skeleton. It pulled that rotting head off of its lap to replace it with the freshly dead one. With its bizarre ceremony finished, the monster turned towards me and laughed before hurling that disgusting, rotten head at me. I barely ducked out of the way. The head smashed into the wall behind me. I was finally jerked out of my frozen terror. All I wanted to do was get the hell out of there. With that thing laughing behind me all the way, I ran. I never stopped. My shirt was drenched in sweat by the time I reached the stairs that took me to this awful place. I jumped them two or even three at a time. When I broke the surface, my vision swam, and I felt all the exertion of what I'd done hit me all at once. I fell onto the grass, swallowing air between my dried lips as I repeatedly blinked to clear the black spots from my eyes. The sweat on my shirt had started to dry by the time I had the strength to stand. I was shaking like a newborn deer, but I forced my sore legs to walk to my car. I didn't bother to punch out my time card. I left that graveyard and promised myself I'd never go back. That night, I sent my resignation letter through email to the old greenskeeper and crawled into bed. The horrid things I'd seen that day flashing through my mind in still images. The creature. The amber graves. The people with their eyes sewn shut. It felt so unreal like a macabre nightmare I'd made the mistake of wandering into. I'd half convinced myself that that was the case when my window slammed open at just past midnight. I bolted up in bed and stared in shock as that creature, that fucking creature, vaulted itself through my window. It didn't pause to wave at me. It only headed to my desk where the book I'd tucked into my jacket was sitting. I'd not tried deciphering it. I'd just tossed it aside and would have likely thrown it in the trash if the creature hadn't come first. I'd completely forgotten about it until I took my jacket off when I got home. It picked up the book, flipped through the pages, and nodded when it realized the book was still intact. Now it finally looked back at me, paralyzed in bed, completely defenseless. It tipped its head at me before it set something on my desk and threw itself back out of the window. When it had finally left me, I finally got control of my limbs and headed for my desk to see what it had left behind. When I realized what it was, I started laughing. It was my cell phone. Its screen still cracked from when I dropped it in the room of Amber Graves.
In my youth, I had a wild streak. I was a teenager during the years when heavy metal began to get old. The group I ran with was fine with the classics, but they wanted something a little more extreme. We wanted something wild, raw, and unfiltered. And we found it in black metal. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm still a huge fan of black metal. It's nostalgic, and all these years later, I've never stopped enjoying it. I can even recommend some truly outstanding bands if you're interested. I can see why not everyone gets the appeal, but I stand by the genre. That said, in the early days, I won't deny that things did get a little bit out there, and I was part of that. At the time, some friends and I had arranged to spend a few months in Norway. The official story was that we were going to study abroad. The truth was, we just wanted to go to see some badass concerts. The best bands were still fairly underground. This was back during the days when Dead was still the front men of Mayhem, and the scene was still wild, so there was a lot to see. There were a lot of bands creeping around the underbelly of the scene at that time. My friends and I all had different favorites, but mine was Lust. Lust's gimmick was that they had a female vocalist. In fact, most of the lineup was female, including the guitarist and bassist. The drummer was the only man. They were just kids, but man, oh man, did they know what they were doing. They really should have broken out and made it big time, but they didn't have that big of a fan base. Their concerts were so raw and aggressive, their vocalist, Anna Mel, seemed determined to sex up the entire black metal subculture as much as she possibly could. She'd come on stage half-naked and strip off her clothes as she performed. She'd smear blood on her breasts and spit blood into the mouths of the two other girls on stage. Looking back on it, I suppose, I used to imagine I had a chance with her. I thought I was just crazy enough to make her fall for me, and I would have done anything she said. The guitarist, Rebecca Olstead, was no less interesting. She was nothing special in regards to the way she played, but she'd typically come out shirtless and wear a taxidermy goat's head. She was the image of Baphomet shrinking dark rifts on the stage, and the audience loved her for it. The head usually fell off halfway through the shows, but Rebecca had insisted it was a metaphor for Satan giving birth to sin through his forehead, and most fans ate that up. The collapse of the goat head was something of a special event at their concerts, and when it fell, the audience would always chant, Sin! 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 Ida Wallen was the bassist. Unlike the vocalist and the guitarist, she had less of a gimmick. She typically dressed in all black and had stolen Dead's corpse paint long after he started using it. But that was all there was to her. Then there was the drummer, Thor Eglund. He wasn't the band's first drummer, more of an in-between piece. Their first drummer had been another woman, but supposedly she'd quit. They'd never bothered to replace Thor. He was barely just a kid, but he fit in just fine. We'd been staying in Oslo, but I'd been fine with traveling to try and catch lust shows. I usually took a bus or caught a ride with a friend so I could get as wasted as I wanted. The shows were mostly small affairs, Little venues with nightly shows of various local bands. Black metal was still small at that time, but there were enough bands to keep a steady rotation going. I was drunk and had smoked most of a joint when I officially met the band. I'm not sure what the hell had gotten into my head, but I decided to wait out behind the venue for them after the show. I barely recognized them outside of their concert attire, Rebecca looked almost unrecognizable with her hair tied back and a black T-shirt on. I watched them bringing their equipment into an old van and stepped out to offer some help. I already knew that their English was pretty good, so I didn't bother fumbling my first impression with my butchered Norwegian. 
Hey, you guys need a hand? Anya looked up at me, a little surprised, before giving a nod. Yeah, we'd appreciate it, thanks. She directed me to their amps, which I was more than happy to help carry. Loved your show, I said. I've been following you guys around for a while. You're great. I'm glad to know someone's listening, Rebecca said. She stared at me intently for a few minutes. I think I've seen you in the crowd before. You look familiar. Thanks. It was all I could think of to say at the moment. When I'd help them pack up, the inevitable offer for a beer came. They were just being polite. I, I saw that then. But I was more than happy to indulge. I'd been dreaming of hanging out with lust for months, and it was basically a dream come true. We sat around their van, probably overdoing it with the booze and shooting the breeze, like we'd known each other for years. So, are you coming to our show tomorrow night? I remember Anya asking me. We'd ended up at a little bar a short ways down the road. It was after midnight and dead silent, but that was fine with us. Thor had left us to go and sleep in the van, so it was just myself, Anya, Rebecca, and Ida alone at the bar. Yeah, I was planning on it, I said. I know they'd be at a slightly larger show with a few more well-known bands. Nice, nice. Well, if you are, maybe you could ride in with us. We could use the help setting up. I'll make sure you're in the front. Maybe we can get a drink after. Sound good? Her words slurred together a little bit. She was clearly drunk, but her proposition still sounded like the best idea I'd ever heard. Yeah, hell yeah, that sounds great, I said. Atta boy, Rebecca replied. You got a car? You can ride in with us if you don't. Now that just sounded like a dream come true. I caught a ride in with a friend, actually, I said. He's probably waiting on me to give me a shout uh, to pick me up. But honestly, I'd be down to ride with you guys for a bit. That was all it took to settle in. They couldn't really pay me for being their roadie, but I was just fine with that. They covered the drinks, and I got to go to a bunch of free shows. It wasn't just them I watched play. There were plenty of other bands. Most of them were small, but a few would go on to be considered synonymous with the rise of black metal. I just didn't see them, either. I drank and got high with them. I saw Mayhem and even hung out with Euronymous and dead before the latter's suicide and the former's murder. It was awesome, and I got tales to tell, but those are for another day. Right now, I'm only here to talk about how it ended. I'd been traveling with Lust for almost two months at that point. During the week, we'd all go back to work. But come the weekend, it was the five of us in their little van going between gigs. Rebecca seemed to manage the day-to-day -day of the band. Thor was just a kid along for the ride, just like I was, while Anya was in it for the thrills. Ida was the only one I never really got a read on. I'd chalk her up to being like Anya, in it for the thrill, but she and I never really talked much. I spent most of my time with Anya and Thor. They'd just finished a show, and I was helping Thor and Rebecca pack everything up for the night. We were already drunk, and Ida had wandered off somewhere else, although I didn't exactly know where. It didn't matter. We knew she'd be back. Sure enough, she was by the time Thor and I had finished. She wore a coy smile as she approached us, hands in her pocket. We good to go? she asked me. Yep, we're all set, I replied. Are we heading out or getting a drink? I was thinking it might be nice to get a drink, Ida said. I was talking with one of the other bands. They mentioned there's an old stave church a few kilometers south of here. They headed over, so what do you think? She grinned wildly from ear to ear. Hell yes, Thor said. Let's do it. Ida nodded, seeming to approve. Rebecca had joined us and was beginning to crack a smile. Count me in, she said. Should we bring gas? Yeah, we'll grab some on the way, Ida said. I'll go get Anya, then we'll head out. I'll drive. I know where it is. 
In minutes, we headed towards the church. Thick black forest surrounded it, and I could see the outline ahead of us. It was one of those old Norwegian stave churches. They're a rarity these days, and it's damn lucky we didn't burn the lot of them. They're beautiful, don't get me wrong, but even more beautiful when set alight. There's no one else here, Rebecca noted as we got closer. We're probably just early, Ida said dismissively. I'll just park. Let's get this party started. She was the first one out and went straight for the door of the church. She tried it, and when it didn't open, she called for a tire iron. Anya was more than happy to provide one, and we watched as Ida splintered the wood to let us inside. Thor and I carried the gasoline as we entered the old wooden church. Look at this place, Ida murmured. A house of lies. She beckoned to me. Give me the gas. I handed the gas can I carried over to her and watched as Ida slowly poured the gasoline down onto the floor in a circle around her. Anya and Rebecca moved past her and toward the altar. They looked up at the figure of Christ on his cross before reaching up to tear it down. Thor, Anya called. Come here. Let's bless this Savior. Thor came running, undoing his pants as he got closer. You want to bless him too? Rebecca asked. I'll even give you bastards something to look at. She started to undo her top before pausing. Someone's outside, Anya said. The other band, I asked, before heading to the door to peek out. There were no signs of another car, no immediate sign that anyone else was there but us. But when I saw them, I swore under my breath. Seven figures clad in black robes emerged from the forest. They advanced on the church slowly, and I pulled back inside. There's some weirdos in robes, I whispered. Anya and Thor both looked to Rebecca for guidance. The desecrated cross fell to the ground. Hide, Rebecca said, and we all did as we were told. I found a spot beside Anya. I saw Thor taking cover behind some of the pews, while Ida hid behind the altar. I didn't see where Rebecca went. For a few moments, all was still. Then the robed figures entered the church, one at a time. They moved in a slow procession toward the altar before stopping in the aisle. I saw Thor pressed to the ground, trying to hide under the pew, although he still craned his neck to see what stood over him. Starting at the front of the line, the hooded figures began to disrobe. The black, formless shapes fell away, and beneath them I saw some of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen in my life. My breath caught in my throat as they stood in the darkness of the church, fully naked and exposed. Get the boy! said one of the women in Norwegian. Two of them broke rank and went for Thor. I watched as they dragged him from beneath the pews. Wait, hey, wait, let me go! He protested and tried to struggle. His pants were still partially undone, and I could have sworn I saw one of the women tugging them off of him. It took four women to drag Thor up to the altar. They dropped him in the circle of gasoline that Ida had made, before holding him down. Thor looked around, panting heavily. The kid was clearly terrified. This was more than he'd bargained and signed up for. Are your friends here? asked one of the women. No, I'm I'm alone, Thor protested. Are you? The women replied and scoffed. She looked at the others around her. We'll begin now, she said. We watched as Thor was stripped entirely. The women straddled him, rubbing his manhood, and guiding him into her. His struggles weakened as he realized what was happening, and from the look in his face, he didn't seem to be enjoying it. The woman on top of him pinned his arms down as the other six women let Thor alone and began to walk in a circle around them. Their movements were rhythmic but stiff, almost like a strange dance. Slowly, their voices rose together in unison in a chant I couldn't understand. 
I couldn't see Thor anymore, only heard him cry out. Before the women switched, someone else held him down, and the one who just raped him took her place in the circle. We have to stop this. Anya whispered to me. I looked at her and saw a quiet horror on her face. It seemed almost foreign to her. Can we? I asked. There's a lot of them. Only five of us. Even enough numbers, Anya said, and I felt her tensing as she prepared to go. But in the moment before she did, we watched as Ida rose up from behind the altar, her mouth moving in time with the eerie chant and her arms outstretched. Sisters! She crooned as she finished her last stanza of the chant. Please, have your fill of the boy. He is yours, as I promised you. Gaitus Fodo is upon us. Drink him. Eat him. The women switched out again. I caught a brief look at Thor, and he looked downright terrified. Anya remained frozen beside me. Neither of us spoke the questions on our mind, but it was there all the same. One after the other, the seven women took their turn with Thor. All the while, their chant sounded quietly, and we watched in quiet horror, unable to run and too afraid to charge in. But once the women were done, things got even stranger. The women took a step back, and the gasoline Ida had poured was set alight. In the firelight, the women danced around Thor, who screamed out in terror. Rise! Ida crooned. Rise, darling dearest! Rise! 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 Women repeated back, and as they did, I heard Thor's scream turn from terror into agony. Through the flames, I could see him writhing on the ground. I could see blood pouring out of his mouth and his eyes wide open in pain. Then came the ripping of flesh. Thor's screams reached a crescendo before they blacked out entirely. Then I saw the shape rising above the dancers. Too large to have been simply birthed from Thor's corpse, but as far as I could tell, that was exactly what had happened. It was pitch black and hard to make out amongst the flames, but what few details I could make out confirmed that it was covered in hair. I could see massive horns jutting out of its skull. Yes! Ida shrieked in pure elation, and the creature looked at her before letting out a goat-like bleat. The dancing women fell to their knees before it, and I was finally granted a look at the monster in all its terrible glory. It stood tall, with the head of a goat and the body of a man. Thick black hair covered the creature from head to toe, and it looked around, surveying the church. No, no, no. Oh, my God! No! The voice came out of nowhere, and from the shadows in the far corner of the church, I saw Rebecca moving. She bolted for the door, and the black goat set its sights on her. Letting out an enraged bleat, it leapt over the dancers and tackled her to the ground. All I heard was the sound of Rebecca's horrified screams as the black goat bit into her skull. Her head was crushed in its massive jaws, and her screaming was cut short. It was all that Anya and I needed to see. As the black goat finished with Rebecca, she bolted, running right for the door, and I ran behind her. The black goat looked up at us, cocking its head to the side, and as we escaped through the door of that church, I saw Ida grinning at us from the altar. The car, get to the car, Anya murmured. She ran over to where we'd parked it before tugging at the door. It didn't open. No, 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 no. Of course, the door was locked. Ida had driven us over. Ida had the keys. The black goat bleated from inside the church, and we both looked back to see it standing in the doorway. Anya pressed herself against the car, petrified in fear, and as the black goat came for us, lurching forward and bleeding, I gave in to my fear and ran. Anya did not. I heard her cry out as the black goat fell upon her, 
and listened to the way she screamed as she was torn open. My legs pumped as hard as they could, putting as much distance between me and that monster as was humanly possible. I don't think I've ever run that fast in my life. I looked back only once to see if it was following me. All I saw was that the church was engulfed in flames behind me and the shape of the black goat against the flames, far away and not in pursuit but still watching. It watched me until I was long gone. I heard that Ida died in the fire. I don't know if I believe that. It's been years since I followed lust and since that horrible night. For the longest time, I had no idea what had happened. I didn't want to know. I just wanted it out of my memory for good. But you can't escape the worst things in life. I won't tell you where I heard about it. Demonology is a bit of a passion of mine and always has been, more so ever since that night. But until now, I've never found an explanation for what I've seen. Most rituals are fake, made up either by superstitious folks or dumbasses. But every now and then you hear about something real. It has a name in Norwegian, but the translation means goat's birth or the night of the goat. All the records I've found say it has never been successfully completed, but the steps match what I saw that night. On holy ground that has been defiled, seven virgins must bed a single man. That man is then to be set ablaze, and as he burns, something will be summoned from the depths of hell, but it cannot survive the night unless it is properly bound. In order to be bound, it requires four sacrifices. Body, mind, heart, and soul. Once it has received them, it is bound to the earth. Undying, unfettered, unstoppable. Thor provided the sacrifice of body when he birthed that infernal thing. Rebecca's brain could count his mind. Anya was found outside the burnt remains of the church. Her chest had been torn open, and her heart had been consumed. But what of soul? What of soul indeed? Not a night goes by where I don't hear the terrible bleating of the black goat. I've had more nightmares than I can count. I've left the black metal scene behind, but the marks it has left on me will never go. So tell me, what of soul? Loretta Piper was new to Spring Hill Assisted Living, the facility where Billy Cosberg worked almost full-time as an aide, but it wasn't long before she cornered him. About three weeks into her brief stay, when he changed the sheets on her bed, she rolled her wheelchair over and shut the apartment door. So, she said as he put on a pillowcase, what do you sell? Billy stopped cold. Sell? Loretta nodded and waved her hand like he could tell the truth already. Meth? Coke? Pot? Her other hand was already digging in the pocket of her red-knit sweater. She freed some tissues, a Carmex, and a baggie of shriveled grapes. Without hesitation, she held the baggie out to him. Try one, she offered. Billy had no idea what to say. He did sell. In fact, he sold plenty. He had customers a hundred miles away but Loretta didn't look like any customer that he had or wanted. He shook his head and looked toward the door. Loretta smiled broadly. There's a fine business opportunity here, Billy, if you've got the brains and balls for it. She rolled toward him by moving her wheelchair with her purple stocking feet. Her thin fingers still clutched the bag. What makes you think I'm interested? Billy asked. He eyed the baggie and saw that it contained little red mushrooms. 
You haven't got brains and balls? Loretta asked. Billy looked at her for a long time. He reached out and took the baggie, looking around as he did. He opened the baggie and sniffed. They smelled odd, but wonderful. A bit like bacon. Not what he would have expected from mushrooms. It would be crazy, he thought, to take a mushroom here at work. He never took meth and only smoked weed Thursdays through Sundays on account of his job. He had never even tried a mushroom. But before he knew it, a mushroom was in his mouth. He felt warm almost immediately. The warmth started in his gut and spread out over his body like warm arms sliding around him on a winter's day. He stood there for a moment, chewing slowly and thinking things over. Even his teeth began to warm. Those shrooms sell for 30 bucks a piece, Loretta said. Bullshit, he said and licked his teeth. Want to give them back then? Loretta asked. No, he did not want to return them, and she saw that. The warmth was settling into his groin, and it felt awesome. Take the baggy home, enjoy yourself, and share with that special lady in your life. Stop by tomorrow. She winked at him, still smiling. She looked like a woman who had probably sold many used cars in her prime. He took the baggy home and told Kelsey, his fiance, to try a couple. She did. He tried two more. Then they had incredible championship marathon sex and passed out. When he awoke, he was sure of two things. He needed more mushrooms, and he could sell them for at least $35 each around here, probably 50 in Minneapolis or Milwaukee. He went to visit Loretta, closing the door himself this time. He handed what was left of the baggie back to her, although it pained him to do it. He had kept ten mushrooms in a little baggie of his own at home. I could maybe sell these, I don't know. How much do you have? Loretta accepted the baggie and dropped it into her lap like it didn't mean a thing. This baggie, she said. That's it? Billy said. You want to do business for half a baggie of mushrooms at 20 bucks a piece? I'm not running a garage sale. I need more than a baggie. I need flow, constant flow. He hoped she had not wasted his time. He had already called his buddy Steve to come and check out the mushrooms that he still had at home. Steve was from Superior and had connections throughout Canada. If Steve liked them as much as he did, they could sell every mushroom this woman had. Have to grow more, she replied. Grow more, Billy snapped. And how do I do that? Do I look like a guy that grows mushrooms for fun? Loretta beamed. No, she said. But you do look like a guy who wants not to work here anymore. You're going to need a business partner. It will need to be someone who doesn't realize that he's your business partner. Someone dispensable. You're losing me here, Loretta, Billy said. Loretta reached into her red sweater and pulled out a small glass jar, perhaps an old makeup container. Inside it was a small, shriveled black thing. She held it out in his direction in the palm of her hand. He walked over and took it. What's this? The mother mushroom. Loretta whispered as though she might be overheard. Do not open the lid until you're ready to take it out. Do not smell it. Do not touch it with your bare hands. Do not eat it yourself. Lots of rules, Loretta. Billy examined it. What happens to the person who eats it? Do they become my mushroom-picking zombie slave? The mushrooms need a place to grow, Loretta said. She was not joking. She was not smiling. The red mushrooms grow on the people who eat the black mushroom? Is that what you're selling me here? 
Loretta nodded. The mushrooms that we ate grew on someone? He nearly tossed the little glass jar back in her face. Except his fingers didn't want to let the little jar go. What's in all this for you? He asked. Why do you care what I do with these mushrooms? You will pay me $10 for each mushroom you sell or eat, and when the black mother mushroom grows again, she said and tapped her fuzzy gray head, you'll let me know immediately, not the next time you work or the next day. Call me here immediately. Billy wondered how she would enforce that. Whoever eats this mother mushroom will die then. Loretta shook her head. Eventually, but not for quite a while. Billy held the jar up and looked at it. The mushroom inside looked like a tiny mummified fairy corpse. Who would he choose? He had no idea. He was not the killing kind, but he could offer it to someone. No one would have to take it from him if he offered it. And if someone took it and died, that would be their fault, not his. He couldn't save everybody who wanted to eat unknown objects. I'll be back tomorrow, he said, dropping Mother Mushroom into his pocket. He was only two hours into his shift, but he told his boss that he was sick and had to go home. He wanted to talk to Kelsey. When he pulled up in the driveway of the trailer house that he shared with Kelsey, he saw that Steve's car was already there. Steve wasn't supposed to be there until after supper. Billy walked into the kitchen and saw that the baggie of mushrooms was open. Half of them were gone. He walked through the kitchen into the hallway, where he immediately noticed their bedroom door was open. Steve was having sex with Kelsey on their bedroom floor. From where he stood, neither of them even saw him. They were too busy grunting like animals. Billy could barely see part of a dragon tattoo that Steve had on his shoulder as he lay atop her. Billy's heart filled with cement. He stood there for what seemed like ages and then turned around and walked back into the kitchen. He walked past the kitchen knives, past the junk drawer with the hammer and out to his car. His gun was waiting patiently in his glove compartment, but as he dug in his pocket for his car keys, his fingers brushed Mother Mushroom's jar. Billy left and spent the day walking in the woods. He returned home at four o'clock, his standard time. Kelsey was gone to work by then. He helped himself to some supper. Then he stood at his bedroom door, staring down at the floor, and wondered how long this had been going on. He had known Steve for almost four years now. He had been with Kelsey for five. Five years down the toilet with nothing to show for it. She had already picked out a reception hall for their wedding. She had baby names picked out. He even had a few names of his own in mind. Maybe today was the first time. Maybe the mushrooms had made her do it. Maybe Steve had taken advantage of her shroom-induced horniness. Last night, when she had eaten her mushrooms, she had also told him about the warm arms on her body. She had even described the warmness for him during sex. When Steve arrived at 7.30... He apologized for being late, said he had gotten a late start. Billy told the lying bastard that his tardiness was perfectly okie dokie. However, Billy saw that Steve's eyes went directly to the baggie of mushrooms on the kitchen table. It was almost as though he had seen them before and knew exactly where they would be. Billy picked up the bag of mushrooms and went to the living room. So... Who did you get these from? Steve asked. A friend, Billy replied. I'm pretty excited about them, and I know you will be too once you try them. I thought they could go to Minneapolis or maybe Toronto. 
When he turned to look at Steve, he saw how wide Steve's eyes were as he looked at the baggie dangling from Billy's hand. He looked like a cat watching a mouse. Steve nodded. I've had some good ones. I bet you have, Billy said, and handed the baggie over. Help yourself. I'll get you a chaser. Billy returned to the kitchen and grabbed a Bud Light from the fridge. He always kept Bud Light on hand for when Steve came down. Billy was prepared for his friend's visits, although probably not as prepared as Kelsey. He opened the beer, tossed the cap aside, and then thought about unzipping his pants and rubbing his balls on the mouth of the bottle before returning to the living room. Maybe he'd save that treat for Steve's second beer. Billy watched Steve eat two little red mushrooms, one after another, almost as though he knew how they would affect him. God, these are good! Steve drained the bud. They're like fire running everywhere under my skin. Everywhere, even my nuts! Billy asked Steve some business questions and how much he was moving over the Canadian border. Steve's answers were mostly vague and unhelpful. Steve asked a lot of questions about where Billy had managed to find a friend that had such beautiful mushrooms. Billy's answers were also vague and unhelpful. When Steve was high and smiling from ear to ear, Billy decided to invite Mother Mushroom to the party. He reached into his jeans pocket and pulled out the little glass jar. The red ones are good, Really good. But you know what's even better? The black ones. Steve eyed the jar, his eyes shaking in his skull, and Billy knew immediately that he wouldn't have to push very hard to make this happen. Steve held out his hand. I'll be able to sell these, he said. He held up the jar with the black mushroom inside. Wow, this is ugly. Try it, Billy offered. It makes the red ones look like Cheetos. You've had one? Steve asked. He unscrewed the top of the jar. Billy's answer to Steve's question would not have mattered at all, but he lied anyway. Yup. And like that, Mother Mushroom was in Steve's hand, and then it was in his mouth and gone. A thought occurred to Billy then that had honestly never occurred to him before. It was foolish to put something in your body when you didn't understand it, and it further occurred to Billy that he had made a living by convincing people to do this very thing. I'm gonna have to crash here, Steve said. Absolutely, Billy agreed and almost laughed. I couldn't let you leave now. I'll be gone in the morning. They talked for a while. Billy agreed to get as many mushrooms as he could. Steve agreed to sell them. They agreed on $40 per mushroom, 60 in the cities. They watched South Park. Billy gave Steve more beer, only unzipping his pants and rubbing his balls on the mouth of the third one. Steve drank and eventually passed out. Billy sat in his chair and watched Steve lie on the couch and sleep. Kelsey would be home at 11.30 when her shift ended. Maybe he would go to bed then. Perhaps he would stay out here and keep an eye on Steve. He wanted to see what would happen. Maybe Loretta was going to put one over on him. Maybe Mother Mushroom wasn't going to do anything. Kelsey came home at her usual time. She noticed Steve and asked if he was drunk. Billy replied that he was and was going to stay overnight. Kelsey helped herself to the last remaining mushroom in the bag. She asked if he wanted to come to bed too, and Billy knew she wanted to have sex. He told her that his head was pounding and he didn't want to. She looked shocked and a little angry that he said no. She had always loved sex and he could count on one hand how many times he had turned her down over the last five years, but he very much wanted to keep an eye on Steve. That, and he suspected very strongly that it was the mushrooms talking. The mushrooms made people super horny. It was as simple as that, 
and that was why they would sell. He could be 300 pounds, toothless, hairy, and with half a sandwich lost in his belly button, and she would still be throwing herself at him. Billy ignored Kelsey's pouting as she went to bed and then sat in his chair and watched Steve sleep. He wondered if the mushrooms would be useful to guys who couldn't get boners. He supposed they might be. He would have to ask Loretta that. If so, they could charge a lot more than $60 a mushroom. He could run them right out of Spring Hill. It took about two hours for Steve to do anything noteworthy. At first, he seemed restless in his sleep and tossed and turned, so he faced away from the end table lamp next to his head. Then he turned his face down so it was away from the light. About 20 minutes later, he awoke, or at least his eyes opened. Billy, who was beginning to become groggy himself, took notice. Steve let out a deep sigh and sat up on the couch. He covered the side of his face closest to the lamp with both hands. His eyes were fixed directly on Billy, who didn't move or ask questions. Steve was sleepwalking. Steve got up and shuffled slowly to the closet in the hallway. Billy followed him and watched as Steve opened the closet door, went inside, and closed it behind him. He did all of this without saying anything or acknowledging Billy. Billy called Steve's name twice, but there was no answer inside the closet. Billy opened the closet door, and Steve's hand immediately shot out, grabbed the doorknob, and closed the door again. Billy debated going to work or staying home to watch Steve in the morning. He checked in on his business partner and saw that he was sitting on the closet floor with his back against a wall. Billy knew something was not good when he realized that Steve had crapped his pants overnight and was now sitting in his filth. His eyes were also open, staring at a vacuum cleaner with no interest. Billy said Steve's name, but there was no response. Steve did bring a hand up to shield his face from the hallway light as Billy stood with the door open. Steve's skin was pale and blotchy. Billy nudged him with his foot. No response. He kicked Steve in the ribs. No response. I know about you and Kelsey, Billy whispered. No response. Not so much as a glance. Billy realized he should have been happy, but didn't feel happy. He felt afraid. He had to leave and talk to Loretta. Kelsey had to go into work early today, and he prayed to God that she wouldn't open the closet door after he was gone. I gave Mother Mushroom to someone, Billy said as he shut Loretta's door. He's sitting in my closet at home now, staring at my vacuum cleaner. He's made a mess of himself. Loretta nodded as though it was the most natural thing in the world. He will like the dark now. The darker, the better. Especially after he starts sprouting. Any sign of Mother Mushroom yet on the top of his head? He'll be alive while he sprouts these mushrooms? Yes. The farmer needs to remain alive. That's important. So don't kill him. Any sign of Mother Mushroom yet? No. When is the sprouting going to happen? If he's in the dark, it may already be happening, Loretta said. You may be able to harvest a few small ones tonight. In the next few days, you'll have a lot more. If he's a big guy, you may have hundreds. Hundreds? Billy repeated. Like how many hundreds? I've seen some folks grow as many as 1,500 or 2,000 shrooms on one farmer. Billy let his fear and panic take a break and did the math. Using Minneapolis prices of $60 a piece would make Steve worth 120 grand. Steve the farmer. Damn right he was. Grow on, Steve. How do I get the mushrooms off of him? Scissors, 
Loretta said with a shrug. That's what I've always used. You are a brutal bitch, Billy said, but he said it with a smile and a laugh, as it was now fair to say that he was warming to Loretta a bit. A hundred and twenty grand will do that to a person, he supposed. How many times have you done this? Well, after I got Mother Mushroom, I quit my job, I can tell you that much. Loretta smiled back at him. Of course, I like to spend money too, so I'll need you not to forget to pay me the ten dollars per mushroom once you've harvested them. The smile faded and then disappeared. And I'll also need you to remember that you must call me immediately when Mother Mushroom appears. You need to know nothing more important than that. Old Mother gets strong fast. Sure, of course, Billy said. There was no way he would give back Mother Mushroom. No way in hell. Not when it could turn a sack of crap like Steve into over a hundred grand. As soon as she... I mean, as soon as it starts to grow, as he said. Can't I just cut the black mushroom off, find another person immediately, and start the process over? Did I stutter? Loretta snapped, and Billy found himself taking a step back from the little old lady in the wheelchair. I will deal with her. She leaned forward in her chair and then stood up. She was tall, very tall for a woman, over six feet at least. Don't ignore me when I speak to you, and don't fuck with me, she said. The graveyard's full of people who fucked with me. She rubbed her fingers together and Billy thought he smelled something burning for a second. Something electrical. Then her fingers spasmed out as though she had been shocked, and she fell back down into her wheelchair. She was desperate, which only made Billy more sure that he would never bring Mother Mushroom back. Fine, he agreed and nodded. He thought that he should probably bring a knife or something the next time he visited Loretta. He could hardly wait to get home, and when he did, he went right to the hallway closet. Steve shrunk back from the light, but otherwise did not acknowledge him. There was a small mushroom growing on the back of Steve's right hand. Billy poked the mushroom with his finger. Yup, it felt mushroomy to him. Steve didn't react at all. Billy gripped the little mushroom by its stem and tugged at it. It stayed rooted to the skin. Billy already had the scissors from the kitchen, and he used them. The mushroom cut free quickly enough, and there was hardly any blood at all. He dropped it into a little baggie. Steve only blinked and made no other movement. Another one was growing on Steve's neck, so Billy snipped it off. Again, there was only a tiny bit of blood. He found Steve's stench challenging to tolerate as he worked closely with Steve. He stunk the whole area as he appeared to have self-fertilized several times. Kelsey was terrible at keeping house, but she would probably notice the smell of human waste in their hallway, and he had to get rid of Steve's car before she got home. He only had about an hour. He moved Steve's car out of the driveway and behind the garage, where Kelsey would never see it. As he walked back up to the trailer, he looked at the panel that blocked the crawl space beneath their trailer and had an idea. He went back inside and returned to the closet. How about we go for a walk, Steve? Let's find a nice dark place for you, Billy said. He tugged at Steve's shirt. If he couldn't get Steve to stand up on his own, this would become a problem. Steve was too heavy to carry. But, as luck would have it, the Lord's face shined down upon his efforts, and Steve reluctantly stood up. He took Steve and guided him down the hallway like an overgrown child. He remembered his crack about whoever ate the mushroom turning into his mushroom-picking zombie slave. As it turned out, he had been mostly right about that. The only difference was that he had a mushroom-growing zombie slave. Billy and his zombie slave walked hand-in-hand out the door. 
The sky was overcast and thunderclouds were coming. The sun wasn't bright, but Steve did not like it. He moaned, put his free hand up to cover his head, and shuffled a little faster toward the panel that covered the trailer's crawl space. Billy made him stop just long enough to snip three more decent-sized mushrooms off Steve's neck. Then he took the scissors and cut through the back of Steve's shirt. The shirt fell away. Steve's body was a lot nicer than Billy's. He was well-muscled, with a dragon tattoo that looked like it was riding his left shoulder. Billy had seen that dragon yesterday when he saw Steve and Kelsey in the bedroom. The dragon had a nice mushroom growing on its ass, and Billy snipped it off before gently guiding Steve down and into the hole that led to the dark beneath the trailer house. You'll be an excellent farmer, Billy said, and replaced the panel. Then he went into the house, scrubbed out the closet floor, and hung a citrus car air freshener from the coat rack. He got done just before Kelsey got home. Later, Billy surprised her with some unexpected mushrooms he knew she liked. He offered her the one from the ass of Steve's dragon first, and she was delighted. He even enjoyed one himself. Then they got down to business. The sex was good, but not as great as before since he no longer loved her. He wondered if she loved him, and discovered that he couldn't remember her last saying so. How had he not noticed before now? The following day was his day off, so he stayed home while Kelsey returned. After breakfast, he decided to go down to check on his farmer. He took a flashlight and crawled into the crawl space. After shining the flashlight around, he saw that Steve was curled up in the center of the crawl space, where he was farthest away from any crack of light. His back was covered in mushrooms. The dragon tattoo was so distorted that it was unrecognizable. Steve faced away from the light and remained unflinching as Billy set to harvesting the mushrooms. When he had two baggies worth, he stopped and looked at what he had done. Even though cutting away the mushrooms didn't cause much bleeding, cutting away so many had messed up Steve's back. His skin was a mass of bleeding craters and mushroom stumps. Billy didn't linger too long. Steve still stunk severely, although he did take the time to use the scissors to cut through the belt at Steve's waist. Then he cut through the pants. Yes, Steve was a mess, but mushrooms were growing on his buttocks. They were smeared with Steve's filth, so he would probably have to reduce the price on those when it came time to harvest, or wash them off and feed them to Kelsey. Billy called Nick, a buddy of his that sometimes ran meth in Milwaukee, and set up a time to meet downtown. Usually, Billy would have met Nick at his own house, but he wanted to get away for a bit. He kept feeling like he could hear Steve's breathing under the floor. Before leaving the house, he had even heard Steve's phone ringing, and he had made a mental note to go down and get it when he got home. He didn't like going under the house when it was dark, but he didn't want that phone ringing where Kelsey could hear it. The power would die on it eventually, but who knew when that would be? Billy gave Nick two mushrooms to try, and Nick seemed to fall in love with him almost immediately, just as he and Steve had done. Then he gave Nick a baggie filled with exactly 50 mushrooms. After some haggling, Nick paid him $36 apiece for a total of $1,800. Nick paid $900 then and agreed to pay another $900 when they were sold. Billy took his cash and went home. He thought more about bonerless older men. How could he market to them? He knew there were some guys at Spring Hill who would pay. He was sure of that. He could start there. He got home and saw that Kelsey wasn't there. She was off work tonight, but her car was in the driveway. The door was also unlocked. Billy looked around for her, and his sense of dread grew as he did. 
When he returned to the kitchen, he saw that her phone was sitting on the dining room table. He knew her password and unlocked it. Her screen displayed a message saying that a call placed to Stephanie had ended. It also showed that Stephanie had the same phone number as Steve. Billy hurled the phone against the refrigerator, and it shattered. When it shattered, he heard a noise from the other room. Billy left the kitchen and went down the hall. He heard another noise, a grunting. The bedroom was dark. He flipped on the light, but nothing happened. Kelsey? He asked. There was a faint, gurgling moan. He went back and turned on the hallway light and then came back to the open bedroom door. The light from the hallway illuminated the floor where Billy had seen Kelsey and Steve having sex the day before. It also illuminated Kelsey's feet poking out from beneath the bed. She looked like a mechanic working on a car. Her feet were moving unnaturally as though something was pressing on the rest of her body to make them move. There was a slurping noise, and then a noise like someone trying to talk with a mouthful of food. Kelsey, get up, Billy said, and stepped forward. From the other side of the bed, Steve stood up. He was nude and covered with dirt and mushrooms. The mushrooms were so thick that they were like rocky armor. The dragon on his shoulder was bloated, cancerous, and bursting with mushrooms. Steve's face was in shadow, but Billy did manage to see a little black horn at the top of Steve's head. Of course, Mother Mushroom. It rode Steve as a little person might ride an elephant. Billy turned and ran crashing into the other side of the hallway and the kitchen. He rounded the table and glanced back. Steve was in the hallway, his hand reaching up to smash the hallway light by the ceiling. Before he did, Billy could see the roots growing out of Steve's head. Thin roots erupted from his skin and buried themselves in Steve's eyes, lips, ears, and nose. Steve's face was coated with blood. Then, it was lights out. Billy made it to the door, threw it open, and went through, slamming it behind him again. Behind him, the kitchen lights went out, and the house was in total darkness. He ran to his car, opened the door, got in, and dug out his keys. He started the car, reached down, and opened the glove compartment to get his gun. That was when his windshield exploded inward. It was early evening, and the sun was already sliding down into the woods when the towering woman, who was sometimes Loretta Piper and sometimes someone else, parked her black Mustang behind Billy Cosberg's Impala and got out. She took her gun and her walking stick with her. Her old heart was beginning to pick up speed, and it kicked into high gear when she walked around and saw that the door to Billy's Impala was wide open. The driveway was dirt, and Loretta could see that there had been a struggle. And, of course, there was a trail where something had been drug back toward the trailer house. Her pace quickened as she knew that Mother Mushroom was close, possibly watching her even now. She had no idea who Billy had given Mother Mushroom to, but they were likely to be mighty strong by now. Mother Mushroom made her farmers strong and dulled their nerves so they could no longer feel pain. Mother's farmers would go anywhere she wanted them to and do anything she wanted them to do. This had been a problem during the last five times she had tracked down and killed Mother Mushroom. Mother Mushroom had not spoken even once, no matter what Loretta did to the farmer that she was riding. And Loretta had done terrible things. Loretta checked again to ensure that the safety of her gun was off. She hated the gun, but it had become necessary over the last few years as her power slowly faded away. Even as little as five years ago, 
she would have felt the crackle of lightning between her splayed fingers and would have made short work of this whole business. But that was not the way anymore. Now she had to carry a gun like every other old lady. She rounded the corner of the trailer house and immediately saw where she needed to go. A panel had been pulled away from the trailer's base, and now the crawl space beneath the house was open. The trail in the dirt led to that opening. As Loretta came forward, she belched loudly. It would have sounded like a belch to anyone nearby, but a word of summoning would compel Mother Mushroom to show herself. It was the only helpful power that Loretta had to use, and even using it once made her head swim. She had become so disgustingly weak. A face appeared in the opening to the crawl space. It was almost certainly a man. It was overrun with mushrooms, so only the faintest traces of eyes, ears, nose, and mouth remained. Loretta seized her moment, just as she had done in the previous times. Old mother, I have provided you willing blood and meat. I have come before you for payment, as is my due. The farmer shuffled forward from the dark hole, and the trailer gave birth to Mother Mushroom's newest farmer. Loretta could see roots that grew out of the skull dragging along the ground as the head dipped low to make clearance for the giant black mushroom that grew out of its head. As the body came forward, she could see a massive tangle of roots that burst out of the back of the farmer's skull and wound back into the darkness. The creature came forward and stood up. The farmer was indeed a man. There was a cluster of mushrooms hanging down between his legs. Loretta raised the gun and pointed it at the farmer's hip. If it rushed toward her, she wanted to knock it down. As she had the last five times, Loretta began, My power has fled, old mother, and I want it back. In all the previous times, Mother Mushroom had never answered her only stood before her, smiling as Loretta resorted to violence to get her to speak. Loretta knew that she had made mistakes in Mother's past incarnations. The meat and blood had been captive rather than willing, or the body too old and sick to make a useful farmer for Mother Mushroom, or too young to withstand the growth of the Mother's children. But now, Loretta was confident that she had committed no oversight. She had followed instructions to the letter. Mother Mushroom would have to speak and tell her what she wanted to know this time. Fairy law required it, and even Mother Mushroom, a queen among the fairies, would not have the power to refuse. The trap was flawless, and it had sprung. The farmer began to smile and looked her slowly up and down. When he smiled, two of his teeth fell out and plopped to his feet. Then he raised a hand and made a gesture like he was telling her to settle down and relax. She would finally get what she was due. He opened his mouth and Loretta's proper name came out in a low croak, like a squished, deflating frog. Bug. Catherine Bug. First you must. Loretta's pulse quickened. She took a breath and listened carefully. Find me some paper and ink. Paper and ink? Loretta said. What are you? The farmer's tongue slid out between his pink lips and his jaw closed. Blood ran down the farmer's chin in streams as the farmer kept biting down. More blood came and the farmer looked like he began to chew. All the while, he still had a smile on his face. 
The visible part of his tongue tumbled forward and hung from his mouth by a flap of flesh. Loretta was overcome with fury. She blew a hole in the farmer's hip with one shot and then put a hole in the center of his crotch with the next shot. The farmer went down. Loretta staggered forward, cussing and repeating incantations that would bring down the lightning, boil a man's blood where he stood, make a man feel like he was being stung to death by invisible bees, drive a man mad when he looked into the darkness of his own shadow. But none of her old incantations did a thing. What power their words had withered and died in the air that she breathed. The farmer on the ground laughed until he choked. Loretta rushed forward and kicked him squarely in the side of the head. A part of her warned against approaching the farmer, but she didn't listen. She couldn't listen. She was just so angry. All she wanted to do was break the farmer's jaw so it wouldn't be able to laugh anymore. She did break the farmer's jaw. She kicked him so hard that she caved in his face. But that didn't stop his arm from flying forward and gripping her leg. She lowered her gun, putting a bullet through the farmer's arm. Chunks of mushrooms, flesh, and bone went flying and then the other arm came out and grabbed her other leg. The next moment she came down, and pain exploded through her legs. Her hip shrieked in agony. She held her walking stick and brought it down on top of the black mushroom that jiggled atop the farmer's head. Part of the mushroom cap fell off, but Loretta didn't wait. Her other arm was already raising the gun to the farmer's face, she pulled the trigger, and the right side of the farmer's face exploded. The farmer's arm shuddered, and his hands clamped down harder. Loretta felt something in her ankles break, the left and the right. She didn't wait. She dropped her stick, steadied her gun again with both hands, and put another bullet in the farmer's lower chin. The farmer's head went down. His arms went slack, and the black mushroom on his head tipped forward to rest on the ground. Loretta was breathing hard, harder than she ever had. She hurt everywhere. She hurt so much that she couldn't even concentrate on crying. Her lips, hip, butt, and now, slowly, a pain sharpening in her arm. She leaned back, dropped against the ground, and then turned and threw up. She saw it then, a face in the trailer's window. More than a face, a half-naked man with roots climbing up through his chest hair and then plunging into the bottom of his jaw. Roots spilled out of his temples, winding around to burrow in again near his lips and eyes. The face was not too mangled for her to tell that it was Billy. She saw it all and lay still. Stunned as she watched him raise a gun and point it down through the open window. Then she raised her gun slowly, but Billy shot the hand that held the gun, and then her gun was gone. Billy! Loretta screamed and pulled her destroyed hand down to her chest, covering it with her other good hand. One of her fingers was pulverized from the look of it. Bug. Billy croaked. Catherine Bog, you old crone. Off to her right, Loretta could hear a shuffling noise. She turned and saw something else crawling forward from the darkness beneath the trailer. It was another human, with roots growing into its head. It was a woman with long hair that draped down to cover her face and roots piercing her scalp. Those roots came from the back of the farmer's head. The woman crawled slowly and breathed very loudly. She was impossibly thin and skeletal, with skin draping off her body like loose-fitting clothing. She did not look up, but she moved straight towards Loretta. 
Loretta had never read about Mother Mushroom having more than one farmer at a time, but she supposed there was a first time for everything. Loretta removed her good hand from her shattered right hand and reached over as best she could to try and claw the black mushroom off the farmer's head. She was nowhere near close. Billy's voice came down like a fog that settled over her. Blood is the answer, Catherine. You need blood to get your power back, and I need blood to raise my children. Together, we shall find blood. Great rivers of it. And we will drink our fill. You will be powerful, and I will be many. When the crawling woman reached Loretta, she took hold of her leg and yanked her closer to the motionless farmer. Loretta lost herself and screamed. She repeated every incantation that she knew, willing the body of the crawling woman to blow apart in any number of ways, but none of them worked. Loretta screamed like an animal, like she had never done before in her 211 years. And then, the woman looked up, and Loretta could see that roots had sewn her mouth shut, and her eyes were so sunken and miserable that Loretta knew at once that whoever the woman was, whoever she had been, she was still inside her body. Her face was filthy, with tear streaks in the dirt, and something had been chewing on her ears. She grabbed Loretta by the hair and pulled her head down to where the black mushroom rested against the ground at the top of the farmer's head. She pulled so hard that Loretta felt the mushroom's skin press against her lips. The mushroom was warm and pulsing, drinking deeply of whatever was inside the farmer's head. Loretta was terrified and struggled against the crawling woman's iron grip because she knew what her end would be. She knew what Mother Mushroom wanted. She wanted what she had never had. A witch farmer. But she also knew that Mother Mushroom smelled wonderful. Like blood and sun and sex and life. And, yes, bacon. In moments... Thin roots rose off the farmer's body and began to slide toward her, the woman who sometimes was Loretta Piper and sometimes someone else. Still, as always, Catherine Bogg found herself unable to resist opening her mouth. Man, I bet half the crap that lady at the Birdcage Theater said was bullshit. A bunch of legends and folklore to get people riled up and scared. Tony grumbled as thunder rumbled off in the distance. Dude, didn't you see all the bullet holes in the bar and the walls of the lobby? Dale said, stepping off the sidewalk onto the dirt-covered street. Bro, I bet I would have been a kick-ass cowboy back then, Jorge said. Who the hell would be afraid of you, Jorge? You can't even grow a mustache. Not to mention your little twig arms. Isaac chuckled as the other two cracked up. A sudden gust of wind kicked up dust into the group of college kids' faces. You guys are jerks. I don't even know I even hang out with you. Jorge sneered. Ah, oh, Jorge, it's okay. I'm sure some chicks dig this skinny pretty boy type. I mean, shoot, you've kept Lisa around for eight months now, and I'm still not sure how you pulled that off in the first place. Anyway... Let's head over to the Oriental, and I'll buy the first round of shots. Isaac clapped a hand on Jorge's shoulder. Thunder rolled across the sky again as the two smiled at each other. The door squealed as the young men entered the Oriental Saloon. Why the hell did we even come to this crappy hole-in-the-wall town again? Tony huffed, unimpressed as he looked across the room. Millie Ray Cyrus sang about an achy-breaky heart on the jukebox, and the crack of billiard balls pierced their ears. 
Because we love the movie and we wanted to come check out the actual town where it all took place, Dale said. Now come on, let's grab a beer. Welcome to the Oriental Saloon, gents. What you having? The bartender asked as he dealt out four coasters. His old-timey mustache, western-style clothing, and southern drawl aided in the illusion of traveling back to the Old West. Hey, man, is this really the same place that Wyatt Earp dealt cards and Doc Holliday gambled? Dell asked excitedly. Why, yes, sir, it is. This is the original building built on this very spot. First owned and operated by Milton Joyce, the barkeep said as he dried out a glass. Awesome! Dale's eyes lit up in full fanboy mode. We'll take four blue moons, Isaac interjected. Coming right up, fellas, he said, grabbing a pint glass and the tap handle. We'll take a round of whiskeys, too, Dale said in a mediocre Doc Holliday impression. Yes, sir, he barked from the other end of the bar. Come on, guys, we can't step up to a real Wild West bar and not order whiskey, Dale said. Here you go, gents. Four beers and four shots. That'll be $32. Jorge slid his card onto the bar top as the others were reaching for their wallets. Don't worry, guys. I got the first round, he said with a smirk. Jorge enjoyed proving money wasn't an issue for him. He enjoyed getting the new hotness before the others. Jorge always got the first round. Isaac beat him too at one time and he made a huge scene out of it. So each time they made like they were reaching for their wallet and let him feel superior about beating them. Hey Isaac, the pool table just opened up. Hurry, go snatch it. On it, Isaac said, moving through the crowd, trying not to spill the fresh beer and shot in his hands. What a ripoff. Damn place is pricey, Tony huffed. I bet this ain't even the real place. They just claim it is so they can charge you out the ass for beer. Snarky condescension oozing out of his voice as he rolled his eyes. A thick, meaty hand slammed down on the bar top with a thunderous clap. This here is the real authentic Oriental Saloon and Bar, where countless Wild West toughs, lawmen, and ladies mingled. Hell, my great-great-uncle tended the horses at the OK Corral as a kid. Some desperado killed his father on these very streets. That godless man hung from the banister across the street. Now, you may not believe that, but you don't need to be blatantly disrespectful about it. The barkeep locked eyes with Tony, and his gaze felt like it bored straight into Tony's soul. You see, Tombstone is the town too tough to die. But neither it nor the Oriental got any qualms about showing people they can. This town and this saloon would have made you piss your pants in its heyday. Be careful with what you say. This old girl, the Oriental, may make a believer out of you yet. Tony stared into his beer, unable to handle the ferocity in the bartender's eyes. The light metallic jingle of the doorbell rang out, and the bartender turned and greeted customers entering in the same light and jovial manner they were greeted with not five minutes ago. Welcome! Welcome to the Oriental, gents! Come, Come on, on guy. In. Let's go shoot some pool, Jorge said, snapping Tony back to reality. Isaac had just finished racking the balls when the guys walked up. Dude, you won't believe what just happened, Isaac! He looked up from chalking his pool cue at Dale. What? He said with a quick head nod. Shut up, Dale, Tony said, low and thin. Tony just got his ass handed to him by the bartender, Dale said, spilling some of his beer, chuckling as he lowered it to the table. I said shut up, Dale. I knew I shouldn't have come, he grumbled. Aw, oh, come on, Tony. Drinking with your bros is better than sitting at home and thinking about how Jessica cheated on you, Jorge said, raising up his mug to offer a toast. <sighs> Fuck it. Fine. Then it's up to you guys to get me drunk enough to forget, he said, raising his glass. Deal, Isaac shouted. To Tony, Tombstone, and one hell of a night spent in the Wild West, Dale said in a joyful tone in direct opposition to his best friend's mopey monotone. Cheers! The sound of clinking glasses muffled their voices. The four college seniors played pool, threw back shots of whiskey, and sang along, albeit poorly, with the jukebox. 
Johnny needs you have the guts to play for blood. Jorge slurred to the group after taking his fifth shot of Jack. I'm your huckleberry, Dale said in his mediocre doc impression. They gave each other a long icy stare and burst into laughter. <laughs> Dale broke the rack and a thunderous crack from the approaching storm outside shook the building. Damn, that storm out there means business, Isaac said as he watched lightning illuminate the plate glass window. The flashes of light gave glimpses of the old town storefronts up and down the street. He continued to watch as the other tourists began speed walking to find cover, and Isaac could swear he saw figures populating the sidewalks and streets with each flash of lightning, but nothing was there after each burst. Goosebumps rippled across his arms, and he couldn't help but feel like there were lots of eyes looking in through the very window he was looking out. Tony stood, wobbling and swaying back toward the restrooms. After practically falling through the stall door, he managed to land ass first on the toilet seat. Reaching into his front pocket, he found a Ziploc bag containing the joint he rolled earlier that morning. The stall door groaned as it creaked open little by little. Planting a foot on the back of the stall door, Tony slammed it shut and the loud crack echoed in the tiny room. Bringing the joint to his lips, he flicked the spark wheel on his bick and watched the flame pop into existence. After two or three quick puffs, he took a long, deep drag of sweet relief. As he exhaled, he wished all his thoughts about Jessica would come flowing out too. He slumped back against the tank, stepping deeper and deeper into the pool of blind relief with each hit. Ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, can I have your attention? We're going to be closing up in 10 minutes. Please make your way to the bar and settle up your tabs now, y'all. Thank y'all. The bartender hollered to the dozen or so people left in the magnificent old building. Well, boys, it's time to square up and mosey on out of here, Jorge said with a southern drawl that didn't quite fit his Hispanic features. Dale looked at him bemused. The human brain shouldn't do what his was doing now, but he couldn't help it. It's like his brain auto-assigned what Jorge should sound like, and the poor southern imitation threw his inebriated brain for a loop. It had done this once before when he was watching some program on Shark Week and a woman of Asian descent was about to be interviewed on the patterns of great whites off the coast of Australia. And when she spoke, a heavy Australian accent came pouring out. Dale couldn't understand why it nearly locked the gears up in his brain. If she was born and raised there, that would be the accent she grew up with. Snapping back to the present, he locked back on Jorge. I think I had too much whiskey. The hangover is going to be a real bitch tomorrow, he said, now back in his normal slightly Spanish accent. Either of you two guys see where Tony went? Dale asked, sliding the wooden pull cues into the wall-mounted rack. Nah, maybe, maybe he's off front, Isaac slurred. He was, he was kind of a buzzkill tonight, he said, tipping back the last of his beer. He couldn't have been that big of a buzzkill, because <laughs> you're way past buzzed, bro. Jorge jabbed at Isaac. Besides, he walked in on this girl getting railed by another dude. Cut him a little, a little slack, man. Let's tab out and go find him, Dale said. We've been best friends since fourth grade. If there's one thing I know for sure is he goes for a walk when he's all pissed off. Did you gents enjoy your night at the Oriental? The barkeep asked as he handed each of them a receipt to sign. Hell yeah, man. This place is great, Dale said as he looked around, taking it all in one last time. Well, I'm pleased you had yourself a pleasant evening here. Say, where are you fellas staying? The bartender asked. The minus cabins. Just down the road, Isaac said, gently swaying as he spoke. Well, those are nice and cozy. Y'all be careful walking in that storm out there. Come back soon now, you hear? He said, looking down and wiping up the condensation ring scattered all over the bar top. Oh, we, we will be back for sure, Jorge said as the three walked out to see the torrential downpour just beyond the covered sidewalk of the old saloon. 
Looking both ways, the three Lushes exchanged glances and headed off in search of their missing friend. Tony sat in the haze of his finished joint, ass numb from the toilet seat. He was unaware of how much time had passed, and frankly, he didn't care. His lower back barked in pain as he attempted to stand and straighten up. He gripped the top of the stalled door and pulled it open, then made his way over to the sink. The knob on the sink squealed in protest as he turned on the warm water and splashed his face. With a couple of flicks of his wrist, he cleared them of the remaining water and ran his hand through his slick back auburn hair. As he opened the bathroom door, he found the room to be empty and oddly still. How long was I out? It wouldn't have been as weird if his friends were there to razz him about taking forever, but they weren't even here. His footfalls bounced off the walls of the empty room. A slow click, click, click issued out as he began walking. The sound which he always associated with business shoes or heels sent a chill up his spine. Hey now, is someone still here? A loud voice reverberated around him. Yeah, who the hell are you? And where did everyone go? Tony hollered back. An enormous wall divided the space where Tony was standing and the bar top. Tony walked towards the double doors he had entered as it joined the two rooms. I'm the bartender, and everyone went home, the voice answered. Tony cleared the wall and saw the mustachioed man behind the bar getting everything in order to open the next day. Where the hell you been, boy? The barkeep asked. I was in the bathroom. Uh, where'd my friends go? Tony's voice was thin and sharp. He hadn't forgotten how this man had embarrassed him earlier. Back to the hotel down the road a little way. I think they thought you already headed out. You know how to get there? He asked while he washed out a beer mug. No, wasn't paying attention earlier. By the way, dude, there's no one else here. You can drop the accent. You don't have to stay in character on my account, Tony said, rolling his bloodshot eyes. What is your malfunction, son? This is my normal talking voice. I ain't playing at no character, he growled. Sure, and I bet that bullshit story about your great uncle or whatever... Isn't just part of some card you had to memorize when you got the job here, Tony sneered. Well, there ain't no two ways about it. You're just a rude little shit, ain't you? Tell you what, sit your ass down at the bar while I figure out just what to do with an ungrateful jackass like you. Tony's eyes locked on the bartenders. A crimson shimmer flashed across his eyes. We might just have to find out what you're made of. The words oozed out of his mouth, slick and oily. Any trace of the southern drawl evaporated. The man behind the bar now gave off a looming presence. Thin lips curled into an awful grin, and he threw the towel into the sink and turned clumsily. Like an awkward puppet controlled by a child, hairs on the back of Tony's neck prickled, and his skin crawled so bad he thought someone would surely see the wiggling under his shirt. Whatever, old man, he grumbled under his breath, a desperate attempt to maintain his macho persona. He stood and backed away from the bar and crept towards the door, not wanting to be here when the barkeeper returned. Gripping the brass doorknob, he turned it ever so slowly, like all those knights sneaking back into his house as a teenager. A light click sounded, and he pushed, but the deadbolt denied him exit. He would have to wait. Tony stewed in the empty room, the low lights of the previous week's events zooming through his head and his current predicament wasn't raising his spirits. The weed was supposed to mellow him out and keep these thoughts at bay, but no dice. The clip of Jessica naked on all fours, some wrestler from Mountain View High's hips slapping against her ass in quick, hard repetition seemed like it popped up every other memory. What the hell, Jess? Astonishment and anguish filling his voice in equal parts. What, Tony? You pissed that I'm getting what I want? All you do is treat me like crap lately and I'm supposed to just be okay with that? She said. Her new stud pulled out and collapsed on the bed, drawing the covers over himself. Jess stood and slipped a bathrobe on. 
Tony couldn't help but notice the larger endowment on her new Netflix and chill partner. What are you talking about? I've always tried to take care of you and give you what you need, he said, blood and heat filling his face as embers of anger built into a bonfire. No, you gave me what you thought I needed. You never listened to me. I tried talking to you so many times, but you always managed to make a joke out of it or give some sarcastic remark and move on. In her mind, Jessica could see the countless times this had happened, like they were playing on hundreds of TVs stacked on top of each other. His facial expression registered that his brain was doing the same. Any retort he had sizzled out and died in his throat. Look, when we first started dating, I have no doubt that you cared. You loved me so fully and wonderfully, but as time went on, you became more focused on your looks and reputation, vanity and status to boot, and smothered the kind-hearted and caring man I fell for. I became a piece of property, not a person. I'm done with that. My mother suffered through an abusive relationship, and I refuse to repeat it. We're over, Tony. Now please leave. Her voice was firm, solidified by her resolve to not end up like the mother she pitied. He looked her over once more, her messy blonde curls flowing over her shoulders, her arms folded, confidence radiating off her. This is what he had loved about her when they first met, how he had crushed that spirit in her he would never know. Tears rolled down his cheek. It's my fault. It's all my fault. His voice came out just above a whisper. Walking over to the bar, he climbed up on the stool, interlocked his fingers, and took a deep breath. He put his head down on the bar, praying the weed would kick in. It's my fault. It's my fault. It's my fault. He muttered over and over. Besides the mantra, he closed his eyes, trying to find the happy memory buried somewhere in his past. Slowly, he drifted into a deep slumber, with Jess drifting away at last. Why, you cheating son of a bitch! Exploding gunfire ripped Tony from his slumber like it was waking the dead. His lungs sucked the breath in with a great gasping sound like he was coming up for air. Hot, dry, dust-laden air mingled with cigar smoke and B.O. whooshed in and out in rapid succession. Tony heard a thump followed by a grunt, but it came through all foggy and distant. His head felt all loopy and groggy, his eyes pulsed in their sockets, and he was sure this was about the worst hangover he had ever had. Well, stranger, it's about time you woke up. Behind the bar stood a man in a button-up white shirt capped off with an oyster gray bead that resembled a pearl for a collar button. His trim black slacks were crisp and sharp. A full but well-manicured mustache and stern but warm countenance fixed on Tony. Trying to gain his composure, he gave the barkeep a bewildered look, then turned to see the man collapsed on the floor. A dark red pool flowed out from around the man, and Tony couldn't help but recall a bottle of his mom's Merlot he had spilled on the kitchen counter when he was 12 or 13. The puddle, on its way to becoming a lake, soaked into the area rug and wood floor as it grew. His groggy gaze moved to the gruff mountain golem of a man that stood over him in a pit-stained cotton button-up, brown pants, and a leather belt and holster hung low on his left hip. Let's see just what the hell you got up your sleeve here, Billy, the golem said, grabbing his right arm. A meek whimper squealed out of the man on the floor. How is this man still alive, Tony wondered as he looked at the vast quantity of blood spilled across the floor. His mind was coming out of the haze rapidly now, like a scene in Star Wars when they made the jump to hyperspace. The surrounding situation was one giant clusterfuck, but he was the only one losing his mind. Everyone else was carrying on like normal, with heightened senses in case things devolved into bedlam, of course, but still carrying on. The thick, meaty hand of the shooter pulled a playing card from the dying man's sleeve. Well, 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 what have we got here? Looks to me like you swapped the Queen of Hearts. Well, since you've got the Queen of Hearts... 
You won't be needing yours any longer. A loud crack accompanied by a puff of smoke burst out of the giant man's revolver, tearing a small round hole in the cheater's chest. His eyes went wide for an instant. His body jolted as he sighed a ragged final breath. Then he collapsed. What the hell are you looking at, mister? A voice like gravel asked as Tony gawked at the lifeless body on the floor, a lighter pool of red oozing over the existing puddle that was now nearly black. Hey! I'm talking to you! What the hell are you staring at? Uh... N n nothing Tony's voice trembled as much as his bottom lip. You're damn right nothing, seeing how this don't concern you. Turn back to your whiskey and mind your damn business. Or you're next. The look on this killer's face was harder than a slab of granite. He stowed his revolver for the time being, but Tony suspected it wouldn't take much for it to make another appearance. He stepped over the corpse and back to his card game. Hey, Milt, you be sure to let Bay and Marshall White know what happened here and why that cheating piece of shit is dead. Tony turned back to the bar, beads of sweat dotting his forehead. Uh, hey, bartender, where am I? He heard his voice, or more precisely, the voice of his body. The tide was washing over him that this was, in fact, not his body. How do you mean, stranger? You're in the Oriental Saloon, in Tombstone, Milton retorted. A queer and curious look seized his face. What year is it? Tony followed up quickly. Why, it's 1880. August 10th, 1880, to be precise, Milt said as he cleaned out a glass. Tony rose off the bar stool and stumbled back. The sound of spurs chiming with each step caught his ear. Looking himself up and down, he found a rough pair of brown boots, dusty black pants with a worn leather holster wrapped around his waist, and a red button-up shirt. What the hell is going on? He mumbled. What'd you say, stranger? Speak up. Look, man, I don't know what's going on, but I'm from 2019. Tony had a wild look in his eyes. <laughs> yeah, sure you are. And I'm Doc Holliday, Milton scoffed. Time to settle up your tab, mister, Milt said, drying his hands on a white cotton towel and flipping it over his shoulder. Looks like you've polished off most of the bottle, so that'll be 95 cents. Tony's eyes were the size of silver dollars as he surveyed his surroundings, mired in the muck of disbelief. Hey, mister, did you hear me? You owe the bar 95 cents, Milton repeated in a stern tone that reminded Tony of a manager he had hated from a short stint working at McDonald's. Chill out, dude. I got it, Tony said, snapping back from his astonishment. No, you don't, a voice whispered from somewhere in his head. All at once, a hush fell over the room. Dozens of eyes locked on him, looking quizzically like dogs hearing a strange noise and cocking their head to the side. As he padded his pockets, he caught sight of the glances and whisperings out of his peripheral vision. With one sentence, he had thrown himself on center stage. Digging his hands in his hip pockets, he found nothing but small bits of cotton. He turned the pockets out and watched small bits of sand fall free of them. It seems I've misplaced my money, Milt, Tony said, wilting inward with embarrassment. Look, stranger, you drank damn near a whole bottle of whiskey. Now pay up, or I'll be forced to detain you so you can explain things to Marshall White. What the actual fuck? That guy just killed a man and you're going to report me over a bottle of booze? People were looking at Tony like his head just morphed into a zebra's. Look here, mister. I don't like your tone, despite not understanding the first bit. I don't appreciate your hostility towards me in my own saloon. As for your debt, you are correct, sir. You know full well duels and gunfights are legal when defending your honor or sifting out cheating scum. He got caught cheating and got what was coming his way. Since you have no money, looks like we will be getting the marshal involved. Milk gave a nod to the young boy by the door. 
The lad gave a nod back and bolted out the door. If I were you, I'd get the hell out of here. The alien voice from a deep well inside him popped up again. Tony could feel the nervous looks from every direction. It was like a giant ball of static electricity. Tony saw a slim man in a black suit unbuttoning his coat ever so slowly to avoid notice. He made a mad dash for the door, but this body moved awkward and clunky to the one he toned and conditioned through his hundreds of hours in high school wrestling practice. The last button on the slim man's coat caught for just a second. He got it open and snatched a pistol up with lightning quickness. He drew down on Tony and fired. The door frame burst apart inches behind his head. Splintering wood pelted his left ear in the back of his head as he ran. Tony's feet shot in opposite directions as he cleared the wooden sidewalk and landed on the dirt street. Passing town folks ducked and moved to find cover. They looked at the man who just burst free from the Oriental. He reached a handout to avoid falling completely and he landed on the ground with a wet squelch. He looked down to find it buried square in a pile of horseshit. Ah, uh, what the actual shit? He yelled, pushing off the ground and flicked his wrist trying to throw off the horse muck. He continued to flee for his life but couldn't believe he was seeing horses pulling wagons and carts through the streets. Everywhere he looked, the people looked like extras in a crappy western movie. Another shot rang out, whistled by his right ear and pinged off something in front of him. Hey, get back here! The gunman shouted. Hell no! Tony shouted. You're going to shoot me and then ask me to come back? You must be freaking crazy, his mind continued as he ran. He dodged behind the wagon trying to escape the line of fire. His heart punched his rib cage with the type of rapid thudding you get from a boxer working a speed bag. His hands trembled and his knees threatened to curl up like wet spaghetti while his eyes darted around, searching for his next move. The afternoon sun beat down as he sucked the hot, dry desert air into his lungs in great heaves. He's over there behind the wagon! A man's voice cried out. Don't let him get away! Another shouted. The crunching sounds of footsteps on hard-packed dirt were drawing near. Tony spotted a small alley between the Campbell and Hatch Saloon in Billiard and the Alhambra Saloon. A crack like a bullwhip rang out. A patch of dirt three inches from his boot exploded. He darted across the sidewalk and flew into the alley. Running down the narrow passageway offered very little cover or room to dodge. If one of the gunmen saw him, it would be like shooting fish in a barrel. Who shoots fish in a barrel anyway, Tony couldn't help but think. The end of the alleyway opened up into a moderately wide lumber storage yard. As he cleared the building to his left, he whipped around the corner just as another thunderclap echoed down the hall. Ah! A white-hot bolt of pain raced across his right shoulder to the pain receivers in his brain. The scream that leapt out of his throat startled him with its speed and volume. Trying not to break stride, he looked over to see a chunk of flesh missing where the bullet had cut a furrow through him. That's it? It just grazed me and it hurt. <laughs> a low chuckling reverberated in his mind as soon as the thought passed through his head. After a quick scan of the lumber yard, he found another alley that opened to 4th Street. He took it. Hey, clear out! Move it! Tony hollered at the townsfolks on the boardwalk ahead, casually going about their day. A woman who looked to be in her late twenties or early thirties in a purple bow dye dress, ivory skin dotted with freckles and curls that shone a brilliant copper hue in the sun, quickly snatched the small child just before being trampled. The sound of horse hooves clippity-clopped with an urgent rapidity behind him. How the hell am I gonna outrun a horse? Hmm. Sounds like you're in a tough spot. The phantom voice cut in again. <laughs> Who the hell are you? Tony shouted as he took a ride and began heading north up 4th Street, aiming for the next left-hand corner leading to Fremont Street. A man on a horseback rounded the corner behind him and fired a shot. Here, let me show you how it's done, the voice said in a malevolent hiss. 
Tony's hand snatched a pistol out of the holster hanging off his left hip. With little more than a quick glance, he turned and returned fire. He caught the left front leg of the horse. The leg buckled as the hoof hit the ground. The rider was abruptly flung over the front and hit with a sickening crunch. Tony stole another glance to see the rider on the ground motionless except for some involuntary twitching. The man's neck snapped at a grotesque angle, and he could feel his stomach wanting to upchuck its contents. Done. You're welcome, the inner voice said. Tony felt full control of the body get relinquished back to him as the gun slid back into its holster. His mind was a crazed hornet's nest as he struggled to comprehend it all. Something inside of him was talking to him and had the ability, apparently, to just take over his body when it wanted. This is the worst high ever. I'm never buying from that dickhead Frankie again, he said, speeding around the corner. Somehow he knew, though, this wasn't the weed. Between the throbbing shoulder, which felt like someone wrapped it in a tangled knot of barbed wire, as well as the smells, sounds, and the voice in his head, no, this was definitely not the weed. Ahead of him, he saw a sign for Fly's Photography Gallery and remembered the empty lot next to it from watching Tombstone. As he entered the vacant lot, he spied the wooden gate that would take him towards the stalls for the OK Corral. Turns out there had been a benefit to watching the movie so many times. Running into the side of a famous gun battle during its time period was just a bit beyond surreal. Another thought replaced that one with lightning quickness. He could very well die on that side. That's the coward killed Tom! A man shouted as he disappeared behind the large wooden gate. Tony's heart raced out of control. Let's string him up! Don't kill him just yet! We gotta hang him! Another voice came from behind him. Tony found a large stack of hay in a vacant stall and dove in and pulled loose piles of hay in to cover exposed areas, then abruptly froze at the sound of trampling footsteps. How the hell did I get here, damn it? Tony thought. They're going to kill me. I know it. The air, laden with the smell of every pumpkin patch he had ever been to, was heavy and oppressive. At that moment, he would have given anything in the world to just be a kid at one of those patches again when the only anxiety he had was picking the wrong pumpkin to carve. He's over here somewhere! He couldn't have got far! The gate flew open and banged off the stall behind it. Tony trembled uncontrollably as footsteps stomped and a jumble of shouting voices grew in volume as they closed in. He could feel his racing pulse in the throbbing bullet wound. Tony folded his hands together. Please, dear God, don't let them find me. Please take me home. I don't belong here. He fought with all of his might to push his prayer across the boundless void of disbelief he held for religion. If God or Buddha or hell, even Zeus, could work this tiny miracle and deliver him back home, then he would never doubt again. Well, probably never doubt again. It could always be a coincidence, he thought. The lynch mob stampeded through the corral. Shit, he could have gone anywhere. You two head back east. We'll cut to the west. Meet me back at the Oriental in half an hour. Tony sat frozen till all traces of the shouting men were gone and then held still for another five minutes. I can't hide in here forever. Eventually someone is going to shove their pitchfork in here and it's going to have my guts all over it. Plus, they'll be back when they can't find me anywhere else. He whispered as he brushed off the itchy long strands of grass. As he opened the stall door slowly, the hinges squealed as to protest the movement. Tony paused to see if this had drawn any unwanted attention his way, his ears straining to hear any and everything, but all he found were horses nickering and snorting from the nearby stalls. He opened it just wide enough and crept out and kept his head below stall level. He glanced back towards the large wooden gate and found it closed and latched. Hey, mister. A small voice that squeaked of puberty behind him. As he turned his head to the left, he found an armed juvenile boy. Before Tony stood a 12 to 14 year old boy brandishing a pitchfork like a Spartan warrior. Hey, you the killer everyone's looking for? 
the lad said as he puffed and tried to ignore his trembling knees. Tony looked the boy over and found a lean but strong young man formed through rigorous daily labor. His resolve stood firm in his steely eyes, but fear definitely held residence throughout the rest of his body. The lad began taking small, weary steps towards the unwanted man in his corrals. Look, little dude, I'm not trying to make waves here. I just want to go home, Tony said as he backed away slow and steady with hands raised in the air. I don't know what the hell you just said. What the hell is a dude? Plus, how would you make waves? There ain't even an ocean near here, mister. A small metallic chattering came from the pitchfork, reflecting the state of its wielder, but the boy continued forward. Listen, just put the pitchfork down and forget you ever saw me, kid. He watched tears roll down the boy's dirty face. His look was no longer simply determination but one of grief and anger. Hell no, I won't! The boy's voice boomed in the silence, startling the horses. The boy's eyes went wide and wild. <laughs> you killed my pa! A quick thrust of the pitchfork leveled at Tony followed the boy's shout. <laughs> what are you talking about? Tony's voice lurched as he dodged the incoming spikes. <laughs> the man you shot at on horseback was my pa! <laughs> He broke his neck when he was thrown from the horse and died. Now he's gone. How are me and Ma going to make ends meet? How am I going to tell little Annabelle Pa ain't coming home that her father is dead? The nerves and apprehension of taking on a grown man had worked their way out of the kid. Now he just wanted blood. Tony's blood. He wanted Tony's blood and he wanted Tony's soul. And he meant to have them both right now. Nothing else would satisfy his thirst for revenge. Tears streamed down the kid's face as he made another desperate lunge to skewer his father's murderer in the abdomen. <laughs> if I could have just slipped out of here unnoticed, he thought, as he deflected the pitchfork. You know what you have to do if you want to make it out of here, don't you? The inner voice pawed at him and Tony could feel the smirk in his voice. He knew what he had to do, but it wouldn't be what the voice was suggesting here. With a firm grip on the handle of the fork with his left hand, he reached back with his right and clocked the kid square in the eye. The kid's hands fell slack as his eyes rolled back in his head. His body gave a small thud as it collapsed. He was unconscious but breathing, tears resting in the closed eyelids. <sighs> Sorry, kid. I didn't have a choice. He clenched the handle tighter and chucked it into the empty stall. <sighs> Sorry about your old man, kid. That wasn't my doing, he said as he grit his teeth against the giggling <laughs> fit in the back of his head. Hey, what's all the ruckus? A man from the street hollered. Tony ran past the boy towards the middle of the corral and found the barrel near the wall. Using the barrel for a leg up, he scaled the wall and crossed over to the roof of C.S. Flies and hit against the parapet that advertised the studio's name on the opposite side. Perched up out of everyone's line, he was content to lie there and wait the day out. Someone knocked out the stable hand, an elderly man shouted. Shit, that's Tommy's boy. Is he dead? A gentleman on horseback asked. No, I'm just knocked out. Uh, perhaps one of the horses got spooked and kicked him, the old-timer proposed. Hmm, except none of the horses are out of their stalls, Jerry, the rider retorted after surveying the scene. It was that murdering coward son of a bitch, he grumbled, gripping his reins tighter. We gotta find him, damn it. Yeah! He gave the horse a stern kick and rode off down the street. Tony laid on the studio rooftop, listening to the chaos swirling about the horses galloping, men barking orders, and startled townsfolks just trying to get out of the way. I'll just hang out up here till the sun goes down. Then I'll slip out of town at night. He sighed and tipped his hat to shield his eyes from the relentless desert sun beating down. Sweat formed into droplets and rolled down brow. A couple dripped right into his eyes with the salty stinging. The roof was hot, and he suddenly wondered if he would make it off this rooftop or melt. His back ached with the sizzle an egg must feel as it splayed across a hot skillet. 
It wasn't long before dark patches formed around his neck, armpits, and back, soaking them as his body tried desperately to cool itself off. How was it this damn hot in August? he grumbled. The sun completed its crawl across the turquoise sky. After spending most of the day baking Tony, it dipped behind the horizon and gave way to the cool evening air. Hunger pains gnawed at his guts. Every time he thought the coast was clear, he would hear a rider asking if they had seen anyone that matched his description. Well, if you see anyone that matches, just shout and we'll come a-running. Oh, I also forgot to mention, he talks funny. Not like a weird voice funny, and it's English all right, but it just sounds strange. You'll know it if you hear it. Then the rider would be off again. It was like he was making laps around the town. Why the hell they suspected he was still in town blew Tony's mind. He hadn't moved in hours despite his parched throat and empty stomach's complaints. A thin sliver of moon had risen over the silver mining town, lending very little aid to his night vision. Tony strained to stay awake and reap the rewards of his patience. The challenge proved too great, and he succumbed to the exhaustion and drifted off to sleep. While he slept, he thought he had had the recurring dream of Jessica, but he didn't. For the first time since they split, he wasn't dreaming of her, and it was a tremendous relief. Instead, he dreamt about his interactions with the bartender of the Oriental from back in 2019. It played on a loop over and over as he stood there like Ebenezer and the ghost of Christmas past. He watched the memory play out, unnoticed by anyone in the memory. The dream grew shorter and shorter with each loop until it focused in on one exchange. The barkeeper defended his lineage and authenticity of the Oriental. A couple of lines echoed in his mind. Hell, my great-great-uncle tended the horses at the O.K. Corral as a kid. Some desperado killed his father on these very streets. That godless man hung from the banister across the street. A vicious thunderclap detonated like a grenade and jolted Tony instantly out of the hamster wheel of a dream he had been stuck in. He gazed up into the pitch black sky and watched lightning burst into view. He watched it splinter into beautifully violent branches of raw power which would illuminate the clouds in brilliant whites, grays, and purples before fading away to black again. Tony stood and surveyed his surrounding. As far as he could see, there was nothing. The town was a tiny dim candle in an ocean of darkness. Blinding flashes and explosive concussions assaulted his senses, making sleep for the rest of the night nothing but a pipe dream. However, no one would be out in this terrible storm, he thought. I could steal a horse and ride off to the next town where no one knows me. Then hopefully I can figure out how the hell to get back to 2019. His mind worked feverishly as he stood firm against a thrashing and howling wind on the studio rooftop. The malignant chuckle returned to the back of his mind. <laughs> you still don't understand yet, but I will reveal all in time. <laughs> the voice said, fading away again. He shook his head and tried to clear it of the voice and its ridiculous laughter. Black creaks issued from the wood as he crept over the edge of the building. Tony wasn't sure if anyone was in the studio, but he didn't want to alert them to his presence if they were. He squinted against the dark to make something out he could climb down on, but he could see nothing. As he crouched by the edge, he also realized even if he got down and got a horse, he had no food, no water, and no clue what direction to go to find the next town. It would be suicide to ride out in a random direction with nothing to guide him, Hell, he couldn't even find the closest fast food near work without Google mapping it first, and that was in a city he lived in his whole life with well-marked roads. I have to wait till sunrise. I'll make my move as soon as I can see, he said as he crossed lightly back over to his resting place and hunkered down. His body gave a hard involuntary shiver, and he noticed for the first time since he had awoken that the wind had a chilly bite to it. It amazed him at how the blazing hot day could give way to such a chilly night. 
The smell of rain carried on the wind filled Tony's nostrils. He gave a heavy sigh and tried to cover up. His night was going to get much worse. Bright yellow and orange bands illuminated the vast canopy above, dotted by white wispy clouds. Tony sat on the rooftop soaked to the bone, hell, maybe even through the bone. The sun's rays were a welcome sight. He hoped they would get right to work on the drying and warming of his clothes and body. The constant shivering had taken focus away from the gnawing hunger pain and he tried to ease his parched throat one raindrop at a time last night, but it hadn't made a dent. Despite his damp condition, the pain was blooming in his guts again. Drying out lasted well into the morning, and it wasn't long before the sun got back to work roasting Tony. He looked out over the arid landscape of cactus, thorny brush, and stony soil. There were patches of evidence from the storm, but the thirsty desert had drank most of it up already. His strength and sanity were slipping, and if he spent another day up on this roof, he may end up having a bullet for dinner. As he climbed down off the roof, he tried to be mindful of anyone that might see him. He especially looked for the kid he knocked out the day before who would return to work now that his father wouldn't be bringing home the bacon anymore. Lumbering down, his body ached, Pain shot off like random fireworks all over his body. The bullet wound screamed a constant loud throbbing in his shoulder, and for a moment he wished his arm was gone. If God was up there, he wasn't helping turn Tony into a believer based on the last twentyish hours. Despite moving slow and groaning with almost every movement, he slipped through the corrals undetected. Finding cover near the alley entrance, he sized up the building across the street for food and drink. I need to rustle me up some grub, he whispered, trying to sound like a hardened cowboy. But the whole thing coming out mechanical was just wrong. How the hell will you pay for said grub, though? The voice chimed in, using an unfamiliar voice. Well, shit, they already think I'm a criminal, right? I'm sure as hell not going to be able to convince them I'm from 140 years in the future, so... Looks like I'm robbing a store, he sighed. A thin smile grew across his face, and he could feel the other entity inside this body's happiness. Well, where should I? He started, just trying to get that stupid smile off his face. Then his eyes landed on it. P.W. Smith & Company Store and Pima County Bank of Tucson. Hmm, talk about your one-stop shopping. He couldn't help but chuckle aloud. Pulling the brim of his hat low, he slipped free of the shadows and blended in behind the young couple. With his head lowered, he scanned the street for anyone he might recognize from the pursuers yesterday. He made a note to look for unfamiliar faces that seemed to search for someone intently. As he approached the end of the street, Tony slipped a black paisley handkerchief draped around his neck up over his nose. The stinking smell of fresh sweat marinating with old body odor and dirt filled his nostrils with each breath. He opened his mouth once, but the sweat ran down his face and landed on his tongue with a salty, dirty tang. It was a lose-lose situation. This man, whoever he is, hasn't had a bath in weeks, Tony thought. God, this sucks, he muttered. As he approached the front doors, he lifted the pistols from their holsters. As he saw the massive 12-foot doorway, he was in disbelief of how natural they felt resting in his hands. The crazy lack of anxiety he felt about what he was here to do. He squared up the door and planted a heavy kick flinging the door wide open. The room filled with startled guests as he entered with guns drawn. Everyone, get your hands up now, Tony shouted, eyes scanning the room for anyone that might try to be a hero. 
Apart from the frightened people, he found a beautifully furnished room with countertops made of black walnut and a resplendent sheen from the varnish. The clear coat, which looked like liquid glass, seemed to draw out the depth and the colors even more. A gorgeous chandelier adorned the ceiling, bathing the room in warm white light. Now, I don't want to have to shoot any of you friendly folks, but I will if you do anything stupid. He spoke in a loud, stern voice as his pistol barrel surveyed the room. Hey there, partner. Take it easy and just tell me what you need. A lanky bald man in a white apron said, I need money, food, and water in a bag, and I need it now. Now move, he said, brandishing the gun in the bald man's direction. A man who had come to Tombstone to open his store and escaped the lawless cattle towns like Dodge City couldn't believe this was happening, but knew better than to argue. The shop owner gave a nod to a strapping boy of about 15, and they went straight to work. The barrel of the revolver exploded, spewing smoke in unison with a thunderous boom. Tony fired the round into the wall just above another man's head. Short, shrill screams jumped out of the other shoppers. I saw you creeping up and reaching for your pistol. The next one will bore a tunnel through your brains, Tony said as he pulled the hammers back, his face devoid of all emotion. Now everyone just stay put and I'll be out of your hair in no time. The young worker handed a bag with bread, dried meat, and two canteens of water to the shop owner. Now open the drawer and throw a stack of cash in the bag and I'll be on my way, Tony barked. Sweat trickled down his temples and his heart raced along at a thousand miles an hour. Despite the nervous energy coursing through his veins, his hands remained steady. His countenance was cold and stern, trying to convey a don't-fuck-with-me persona. A small bell dinged bright and clear as the man opened the till and grabbed a stack of twenties and shoved them into the bag. The shopkeeper folded the top of the bag over and presented it to the robber. Here you go, sir. Now please take it and be on your way. Tony slowly lowered the hammer of the pistol in his left hand and returned it to its resting place. He snatched a sack and headed for the door as he alternated pointing it to the left and right. So neither side tried something stupid. He stopped at the door and propped it open. Then he peered out to ensure the coast was clear. With a quick jerk, he turned back and fired two rounds into the ceiling and sent the ornate chandelier crashing to the ground as he slipped out. Snatching a nearby horse from a hitching post, Tony mounted the beast, gave it a kick, and rode westward as quick as the horse could muster. He cleared the town edge in quick fashion and spurred the horse on, yeah, desperate yeah. to leave Tombstone behind for good. After some time, it dawned on him he had no earthly idea where he was headed, but a jumbled cocktail of shock and amazement that he had actually pulled it off filled him. Wild laughter poured out as the horse's stride covered huge chunks of land in front of them. Tony grabbed a canteen looped over his neck, spun the lid off, and swallowed the contents in huge gulps. A memory flashed into his mind, taking him back to the last time he craved water this intensely. He was a sophomore on the high school wrestling team. Cutting meals and limiting his liquid intake to make way in had become standard practice during the season. Losing the last pound that week had proven to be difficult despite all the miles logged in sweats and garbage bag sauna suits. He made weight, 145 on the button. As he stepped on the mat, his body wrung free of all food and water, he swayed. A double vision of his opponent stood before him, coiled and ready to attack. A sharp pitch cut through the bleary fog and his body moved on instinct and repetition alone. He wanted nothing more than to collapse, but his will drove him on and after an agonizing minute and 48 seconds, the sharp sound cut in again and all went dark. At the hospital, his father told him he pinned the kid from Mountain View just before passing out. Even with an IV pumping water back in, he grabbed a pitcher of water from his mother 
who had been pouring a cup for him and drank it in huge gulps after tossing the lid aside. As he finished the first canteen, the memory faded back into the archives, and he dropped it back to his hip with the other one. As he rode along, he scanned the terrain for any kind of road or trail that would guide him towards the next town. The horse galloped along at full pace for the first two miles before slowing to a trot and eventually to a walk. Tony scanned the landscape behind him but found no pursuers yet. With things settling down, he reached into the bag and pulled out a strip of dried meat. His teeth latched on and pulled the chunk free with a sound like paper being torn. Jeez, this shit is tough, he said as his mouth dried up instantly. Wow, this crap really is dry. And is it too much to ask for a little flavor? All I can taste is salt, he said, after ripping another bite free and storing the rest back in the bag. Tony spotted a pair of thin parallel grooves cut into the desert as he climbed the bank of a dry riverbed. Hmm, looks like some wagons have come through here, he thought. The sun beat down as various birds patrolled the sapphire sky for mouse or juicy rabbit. Rattlesnake shook out a warning from the underbrush. The wagon trail led onwards towards some mountainous terrain and he wondered if he would spot anyone from out here. He couldn't start a camp at night if his life depended on it, which it does, nor could he keep the horse from taking off as he slept. Oh, God, how did people live like this? He groaned. Off in the distance, the white canvas of a wagon appeared as it rounded a tree at the bottom of a ridge. Tony waved at the wagon and gave the horse a stern kick of encouragement. He called out to the wagon's driver as he rode to intercept him. Please stop! I need your help! He hollered as he approached the wagon. Whoa! Whoa! The wagon driver called to his team as he pulled back on the reins and stopped the wagon. Hey folks, can you help a brother out? Tony said in a cheerful tone as he trotted up alongside the wagon. The driver and the young man next to him looked at each other, bewildered. Look here, stranger. I only have one brother, and the winter in fevers took him two years back. You must have me mistaken for someone else. Now, if you'll excuse us... The driver took up the leads in his hands. Whoa, hold on there, partner. I just need you to tell me where the next town is. If you could just point me in the right direction, please, he said pulling his horse in front of the wagon. The two gents exchanged a look, then nodded. It ain't a town by any means, but there is a mining camp named Bisbee beyond this mountain. It's about a day or so ride to get there. Now, if that'll be all, we'll just be on our way, stranger, the driver said, his eyes closed to narrow slits by the sun, and yet predatory, sharp like a hawk. There was still in those eyes, a chill slid down Tony's spine and prickled his arms in goose flesh. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Tony said with a smile, but made no move to clear out of the wagon's path. A faint voice of the whisper tickled the back of his brain. Kill them. Just kill them. Kill them and take the wagon. It grew in volume until it was a deafening scream. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them! Kill them already! Tony's joints felt like he was the tin man after a rainstorm. Everything locked in position. It's clear. You don't have what it takes to play the role of the body you're in. The voice inside said, Watch and learn. Mind moving over, partner? You're blocking the trail, the driver said, glaring at the stranger before him. As a matter of fact, I do mind. Tony heard the words come out, but knew he hadn't thought the words, let alone said them. 
This was like earlier when his arm moved on its own, shooting the horse, but now he had no control at all. Say, friend, anyone ever tell you the one about the cow and the pig on the railroad? He said with a toothy grin. Confusion passed between the two, and they each gave a slight shake of their heads. Ah, well then let me be the one to tell you. Y'all get a hoot out of this. Tony listened to the thing that took over this body, and the voice sounded like a voice coming through cans attached by a string. It was mostly clear, but had a slight metallic tone. Come on, mister, we ain't got all day. The young man next to the driver barked. A deep furrow set in his brow. True, the voice said, peeling back his duster to reveal his 1851 Colt Navy revolver, resting in his left hand and trained on the driver. Now, now we ain't looking for no trouble, the driver said, a slight tremble in his voice. Oh, I ain't looking for trouble neither, but I love a captive audience. Now... If you don't mind, I'll continue with my joke and be on my way. Psst, Junior, drop the shotgun and pull your hand out of the canvas before I install a window in your skull, the voice said, flashing a gnarled brown set of teeth. The young man gritted his teeth as he held the weapon. Drop it, son, his father said in a low, even voice. A light thump sounded his compliance and he withdrew the empty hand from the slit in the canvas. Good, good. Now, the cow is hoofing along down the railroad when he comes upon a fat pig standing smack dab in the middle of the tracks. The cow pauses for a moment, hoping the pig will see him, but the pig doesn't budge. Minutes go by and the pig just stands there, vacant expression on his face. Annoyed by the situation, the cow looks down and shouts, Hey, can you move over? You're a hogging up the railroad. <laughs> the creature controlling Tony's body laughed like a hyena as the two men stared in wonder at the rider before them. Really? Not even a smile? What, didn't you get it? Oh well, guess that makes up my mind. Two loud blasts rang out in quick succession, and both men fell from the bench, hitting the ground with a thud. I have properly installed your skull windows, <laughs> the voice said with a chuckle. Tony rode along inside this body, trembling at the sight of brain and blood dripping out onto the dry desert sand. What the hell is going on and why can't I move my body? Why is this thing killing people? A multitude of thoughts flooded his mind as great as any raging river. Have you even considered once since you've been here that this ain't your body? The voice said with a smile. <laughs> You're from the future, so how could you have a body back in the Wild West? The voice stowed the smoking barrel back in its holster and dismounted. Who or what in the actual fuck is this thing and how does he know so much? Tony wouldn't have believed this if he was watching it in a movie theater, yet it was happening to him. Let's go see what goodies these two were hiding. Gravel crunched with each step, and as they approached the back of the wagon, he heard light whimpers. The truth and the secret I've held on to this whole time, the voice said, gripping each flap of the slit canvas. I'm the one that sent you here. He flung the draped canvas with a dramatic flourish. A chill ripped through Tony's soul. Who are you? And how are you able to send people through time? Tony's voice quaked as he asked. Huddled in the left front corner of the wagon sat a middle-aged woman, a boy of ten or eleven with dirty blonde hair and bright green eyes, and a girl around seven with chestnut-colored hair split into pigtails and red ribbons. 
She stared in horror at the monster responsible for killing her father and oldest brother through the same emerald eyes. This monster surveyed them like a lioness hunting an antelope. I am an ancient being. I drifted aimlessly for millennia before the dawn of man, he said as he scanned the rest of the wagon. Beyond some life-sustaining supplies, there was nothing of any real value here. I am benevolent when treated with kindness, or I can be vile and malicious when disrespected. Care to venture which side of the coin you're on? He said with a sneer. Tony sat incredulous and helpless somewhere inside this thing. How could I have disrespected you? I've never even met you! His fury burned bright and hot. Could this all just be a case of mistaken identity? Tony watched as the young boy extended a trembling hand toward the shotgun lying beside him. Splinter and wood exploded just inches in front of the tiny hand. The smell of gunpowder and smoke permeated the air. I would leave that right where it is, son. You got me, the gunman said with a toothy grin. Tears streamed down and whimpering cries squeaked out of the wagon. The boy stared at the monster standing before him and hoped to discover a weakness that would give him the edge. There was none. The gunman had a revolver fixed on the boy and wasn't taking him lightly because of his youth. Hey, let them go and deal with me, damn it! Tony's voice echoed inside the nameless being. Hey, you! Well, what do I call you? What is your name? Since no one else would, I gave myself a name. I am Ionios. It is the Greek word. For eternal, he said in a low hiss. Okay, Ionios, where, or I guess more appropriately, when did I meet you and how did I disrespect you? Tony probed, trying to pull the immortal's focus. Do you recall the barkeep at the Oriental from your time? I was living in him at the time. Your shitty attitude towards him and complete lack of respect showed me you were in need of a lesson, an attitude adjustment as it were. So I brought you here. I wanted to see if you were the big tough guy you think you are in an era chock full of hardened, take no shit men. You are an outlaw here. If you want to go home, you will do as I say. The woman and her children sat terrified of the gunman and the conversation he seemed to be having with no one. Look, I'm sorry for my behavior back then. I'm struggling with some issues and I always take out my frustrations on others. I didn't- So that gives you the right to treat others like shit? Sorry. But you won't be getting off that easy, Ionios growled. S sir who are you talking to? The trembling mother asked. Please, just spare my children. You can take whatever you like. I'll do anything you ask, but spare them, please. I beg you. Shut your mouth, Ionios growled low and sharp. Tony! You want to go back to your own time? Tony sat bolt upright, as if there was such a thing in this place. Of course, just tell me what you want. His voice was hopeful there would be an end to this soon. Fine. Kill this woman and her children. Tony could feel the joy he was getting from this. It was all around him. He felt the blood drain from his face. There was a sudden strange sensation, like being yanked forward by a lasso, and presto, he was back in control of his body. I can't kill these people. They don't deserve that. You'll do it all right, or you'll be stuck in the 1880s never to return home. Ionios' voice reverberated in his mind. Thunder rumbled off in the distance, low and constant. 
A brilliant amber sun sat on the horizon, seeming to rest on the earth for a moment. The fading light painted the sky a brilliant tangled mixture of tangerine, violet, fuchsia, and crimson. The hostages sat motionless inside the wagon with bated breath, waiting for a madman to decide their fate. Get out! The children winced as Ionios barked and controlled the body once more. No! Don't do this! Tony's voice shouted from the gunman as he struggled to regain control. None of the hostages knew just what they were supposed to do. Should they stay in or climb out? Which would keep them alive? Do as the man says, children. Her voice cracked. <laughs> the thunder grew louder as they climbed from the wagon. Tears filled Tony's eyes and cut tracks through the dirt and grime on his face. The revolver rested limp in his hand. He looked up to see the stars beginning to adorn the night sky. There were very few clouds to mar the beauty of this view. It's time, Ionio said. No, I can't do it, Tony whispered. They don't deserve to pay for my mistakes. He raised the pistol and placed the barrel on his temple. Just what the hell do you think you're doing, Ionios growled. I wonder if I die. Do you? Tony said, looping his index over the trigger. If you do this, you can never go back home. I can take you back. I can take you back to a time before Jessica cheated on you. Tony froze for a second. I can take you back, and you can fix it all. Tony had never heard this all-powerful creature lose its cool, but he was. He begged so he wouldn't die either. The idea of going back and fixing his past sounded amazing, but that was just a dream. He had screwed over Jess pretty hard, and what right did he have to toy with the past? He would be no better than this thing inside him, jumping through time and blowing up people's lives like a landmine. He had had his chance with her and he blew it, but he could take care of this creature once and for all. Well, tough shit for both of us. You gotta die, Tony smirked and closed his eyes. With a final exhale, he squeezed hard, wondering if he would hear the explosion before the bullet tore through his skull and brain. Instead, he heard nothing. He eased one eye open to find everything just the way it had been. What the... Did you think I would just let you kill us? <laughs> Ionios cackled. The barrel of the gun trembled against Tony's head, his finger lightly pressed against the trigger. Tony squeezed again and again with every ounce of willpower he had, but the finger didn't budge. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm not ready to punch out just yet. <laughs> He said, laughing maniacally. In a slow, smooth motion, the gun peeled away from his head and extended towards the woman before him. Her mouth stood open, hand raised in front of it, aghast at the lunatic in front of her. No! Tony's voice slid through gritted teeth as he strained to take back control of the body. Huge veins bulged in his forearm and neck. You're going to do this, even if I have to force you, Ionio said, regaining control. Run! Tony screamed. His heart raced as adrenaline flooded his body. He strained, desperate to slow this monstrous creature. The woman shoved her son and daughter away. Run as far and as fast as you can! Never look back, do you hear? The thunder that had been rumbling off in the distance sounded so close now and so clear. The young boy grabbed his sister by the wrist and yanked her along behind him as he ran. Mommy! Her small face gushing tears as horrified screams came over and over like her brain was caught in a loop. After clearing the horses, he began weaving through the brush and cacti. Peering over his shoulder, he glimpsed his mother standing defiantly. Her arms stretched wide open. It broke his heart that he would never again feel the warm embrace of those arms. She gave the best hugs. Hey, Tony, 
Ionios called out as he leveled the gun at the woman's abdomen. <laughs> what? He muttered through gritted teeth. You ever heard the old saying, You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? The creature probed. <laughs> yes, he answered, confused. Drink. The barrel of the gun bellowed with a brilliant flash and a cloud of smoke. In a millisecond, the projectile tore through clothing, skin, and guts, forcing a scream to leap from the woman's throat. A fresh crimson rose bloomed across the woman's dress, her hands clutching her stomach. Tony felt the strange lassoing sensation again and stood frozen in place. His jaw hung as if disconnected, his arms stretched out holding the smoking gun. A loud burst detonated behind Tony, and a lightning bolt of pain lanced through the back of his knee. Five men on horseback rode up and bore down on him. He dropped the revolver as he fell to the ground, cradling his shattered knee as the thundering horses and their riders circled around him. One rider approached the dying woman and cleared his saddle before the horse had even come to a stop. She looked down to see her hands dripping with blood. Her knees unhinged and she fell. The rider caught her and laid her down gently. Hang on there. I got you, ma'am. You're gonna be okay. She looked up at this gentleman who could have only been a year or two older than her oldest son. His voice was calm and reassuring and there was warmth and kindness in his eyes. You're a good young man. Don't let this world take that from you. What in the Sam Hill is going on here? shouted a man wielding the revolver on horseback. What did that woman do to you that made you feel like you had to skin your smoke wagon and bury a bullet in her guts? Tony looked up at the stocky rider with broad shoulders piercing brown eyes and jet black hair. The rider continued to circle the wounded gunman like a vulture circling a carcass. Um, Senor Dell, I don't think he's buried in her. I think he came out her back. A squat, slim Mexican man interjected. Damn it, Jose, shut the hell up. That ain't the point, Dell scolded. Uh, your name is Dell? Tony asked, still wincing and clutching the remnants of his knee. Yeah, that's right. What's it to you? Dale retorted, shooting him a look of disgust. My best friend back home in my time. His name is Dale, too, he said, looking him straight in the eyes. Well, ain't I lucky? Now, tell me just why the hell you shot her? His eyes narrowed in on Tony, ready to measure every single word for deception. Um, senor, Jose popped up once more. Damn it, Jose! What now? He barked. It's not just her. There are two more dead men over here, Juan stated flatly. Probably her husband and son from the looks of it, he added for good measure. Dale jumped from his horse, spurs jingling with each step. He gripped Tony by the shirt and planted a hard right cross on his cheek. Answer me now, goddammit, he said as he released the shirt and stepped over to the injured knee. Look, this is gonna sound crazy, but you gotta believe me, Tony said, sitting up on his elbows. Well, you're mistaken, partner. I don't have to do a damn thing you tell me to. Dell paused for a second and ground his spur into the raw flesh of the shattered knee. White-hot pain streaked up Tony's leg and hit his brain like a tsunami. I swear to God, there's a creature inside me right now. His words were mixed with screams of agony. It's ancient. It brought me here from the future. And he's the one who killed those people. Tony sobbed, begging for Dale to believe his story. <laughs> Wild laughter broke out among the riders. Dale didn't even crack a smile. To hell you say? You think this is funny? What? You think you can blame it on some boogeyman inside you? And people are supposed to care? 
Your actions are your own, not some demon. Dale got right down in Tony's face. You don't understand. It really wasn't me. I didn't kill these people. Ionios laughed hysterically as Tony lay on the ground pleading with Dale. Hey, this is better than I could have hoped for. <laughs> he said between laughing fits. Look, stranger, I don't give two shits what you say. I know what I saw with my own eyes. You're coming with us to Tombstone, and we're going to string you up. <laughs> no! Wait! Dave cracked Tony in the back of the head with the butt of his pistol, knocking him out cold. Frank, tie him up. Throw him in the wagon. John Henry, how's the woman? Dale asked as he mounted his horse. She did. She says she had two more children that ran off, heading east, John Henry said, cradling the dead woman's body. Well, load the bodies in the wagon, too. We're about to lose daylight soon. Each rider sprang into action. After loading the woman into the wagon gently, he mounted his horse and rode off after the kids. Once everything was loaded up, they set off for Tombstone. The temperature cooled rapidly once the sun was gone. Tony could feel the wagon bumping along and could hear mumbling voices outside, but was unable to open his eyes. Well, <laughs> this is a bit of a pickle you've gotten yourself into. <laughs> Ionio snickered. Yeah, except I didn't get myself into this mess. You did. I didn't shoot those people. You did. True. But it's been so much fun for me. And when you've been around for as long as I have, it's really hard to find entertainment. Killing people? Sending us through time and destroying families? That's what you call fun? Like we're just toys for your amusement? Basically. And y'all ain't even good toys. You're like janky dollar store water guns that leak more out of the trigger than you shoot from the barrel. Ionios teased. Tony could hear voices outside the wagon mumbling and gossiping. He still couldn't force his eyes to open up, though. They may as well have been welded shut. Hey there, folks. Clear the street, please. A timbering voice called out. A moment later, the wagon jerked to an abrupt stop. The horses whinnied and snorted in response to the pull on the reins. Good evening. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Said a man who had clearly grown up in the Northeast. His accent resembled nothing like the rest of the people he had come across in Tombstone. Well, your honor, we're here to hang a man. Dale's voice came from Tony's left, and his casual tone scared Tony even more. Like buying a bag of popcorn at the movies or ordering a meal at a drive through Hanging people is just what they do. And, uh, what reason have you to hang said man? Also... What proof can you provide he committed the crimes? Spicer questioned. For starters, your honor, my men and I witnessed him murder a woman in cold blood. Then there's the dying woman's last words. She informed us she had two young children who fled so as not to be killed as well. Finally, your honor, Dale pulled back one side of the canvas cover and exposed the three dead bodies lying beside Tony. The children can testify that this man killed their father, older brother, as well as their mother. Hmm, that's quite the volume of evidence, the judge said, pondering the situation. What's there to think about here, judge? Hang him! An onlooker shouted. We don't need another killer around here. Hang him! A portly southern bell shouted. The wagon spring squealed as the wagon bucked abruptly. One hand pulled him up by the collar, then Tony heard a whip crack and a hot sting shot through his cheek. A big, meaty palm slapped him like a rented mule. Wake up, you son of a bitch! Dale growled. His eyelids flew open, and he sat bolt upright. The sudden movement startled Dale, and he threw a straight right to Tony's nose, more so out of reflex than conscious decision. 
Stars exploded around the periphery of his vision as he reached for his face with hands bound by a leather strap. Jesus Christ! What the hell was that for? Tony moaned as he tinted his fingers over his throbbing nose. I'm all tied up, dumbass. What did you think I was gonna do, try to shoot my way out? You're gonna be spitting teeth out of that loud mouth if you don't shut it. Dale's voice cut in cold and sharp. Gripping his shirt with both hands, he lifted Tony to his feet and shoved them toward the rear of the wagon. He took a few awkward hunched over steps and narrowly avoided stepping on the corpses. With some assistance, he clambered down off the wagon to see a lynch mob take form. Do you know who I am, son? My name is Wells W. Spicer, and I'm the judge here in Tombstone. What do you have to say about these accusations, stranger? Tony stared at the man who would decide his fate, not entirely believing this was how the court case was being handled. Well, Spicer appeared to be very average. He had thin hair with a receding hairline and an average build. A salt and peppered mustache dressed his upper lip, and his suit was nice but not overtly wealthy. Here was an extraordinary situation, and it's going to be judged by his honor, Mr. Plano Ordinary. Wells spoke again, and it snapped Tony out of his appraisal of the man. These are some very serious charges. What do you have to say in your defense? Look, your honor, like I told Dale before, yes, tell them about the monster living inside you that made you do it. That will win them over and not make them want to kill you at all. Ionios's voice echoed in Tony's head. There is a dark entity in me. It's not part of me. It's something ancient and, in my opinion, evil. I disrespected it, so it brought me here. It doesn't care about humans and it has no qualms with killing us. Tony locked eyes with Spicer and hoped he conveyed sincerity. What you mean? Like some kind of demon? You got the devil inside you? A pudgy man added. Judge Spicer, but we don't want a demon living in our town and preying on our women and children. A slender shop owner said as he clutched his wife and small boy in his arms. I say we hang him, an old miner croaked. The organized crowd devolved into crazed shouting and bloodlust. Hang him! Hang the demon! cried people in the crowd. Others prayed. Still others shouted different versions of, Send them back to hell! Hold on now, folks. Just calm down now. Judge Spicer held up his hands in an attempt to quiet the mob. Let's just calm down now, folks. We still need testimony from the children. Dell, if you would be so kind, please bring the children before me. Dell nodded to the driver of the wagon. Reaching to his right, he grabbed a young boy, then a young girl. Lifting each from the seat by their hips, he lowered them to the ground and gave them a point to Dave. On the other end, Dave painted on a smile and beckoned them over. Good evening, little one. Spicer softened his voice, trying to understand all they had endured. I just need you to answer a couple of questions. The two children exchanged a glance and nodded. First, do you know this man? Each nodded. Did this man kill your parents and brother? Again, they nodded, but less frightened this time. You are absolutely sure you saw this man. Take a minute and take a real good look. You must know it was him without a shadow of a doubt. Each child eyed him up and down, and each said yes on their own. Yes, Your Honor. The young lad spoke first. I can never forget this monster. It was him. The small girl added. That's bullshit, Your Honor. They couldn't have even seen me do it. Tony lashed out. This spooked the children, and they ducked behind Dale. Oh, and why is that? Spicer craned his head and raised an eyebrow like a fish hook snagged it. Tony never understood how people were able to do that. He used to stare into the mirror after his shower and attempted over and over, receiving only ridiculous looks in return. Well, first off, they were in the wagon with no line of sight when their father and brother got shot. Second... They were already a hundred yards away in thick brush when their mom was shot. Tony spoke like he had just cracked a code that would set him free. 
Now, just exactly how would you know all that unless you're the one who shot these poor souls, Spicer said, reaching up and grabbing his lapels. Tony opened his mouth for a rebuttal, but the words died in his throat. He had just incriminated himself without a doubt. Tony lowered his head in defeat. Hey, Judge! A man's voice called from the crowd. That man robbed the bank at gunpoint earlier today. Everyone's head whipped around. He also took off from the Oriental without paying for an entire bottle of whiskey he drank. Milton piled on. Tony stood stunned. How could this get any worse, he thought. He killed my pa, too. A boy shouted over the murmurs. He shot my pa's horse, causing the horse to throw him. My pa landed on his head and broke his neck. Tony turned his head to see the lad he fought. A young man that charged with a pitchfork with sorrow and rage in his heart now stood in the crowd with a large black eye. Ionios laughed so hysterically, Tony wondered if it would drive him mad. He wanted someone to drive a hot poker through his ears so he wouldn't have to hear it anymore. Well, stranger, sounds like you've torn a tornado path through my town in a rather short time. Based on the testimony tonight, it sounds like the world might just be better off without you. However, the arm on the gallows needs to be replaced due to dry rot. So looks like we will have to postpone. That's okay, Judge. We'll string them up at the Bucket of Blood Saloon across from the Oriental. Dale cut the judge off abruptly, giving Tony a narrow smirk. Well, what can I say, Tony? You should have been more careful about who you mouthed off to and how disrespectful you were about it. Ionios chastised. Tony stood there on one good leg, holding the blown out knee the best he could. Disbelief washed over him. How had things spiraled this far out of control? A couple of days ago, his biggest issue was how to get over a girl cheating on him. Now he was on the back of a wagon in 1880 Tombstone with two bullet holes and a laundry list of charges, the verdict of which sentenced him to be hanged. What the actual fuck? The wagon came to an abrupt stop, and Tony flipped back and hit his head on the bed of the wagon. The wood issued a solid thunk, and he grimaced with pain. He turned his head to his left and tried to ignore the fresh bloom of pain. He was met with glossy, vacant eyes of the dead woman. A horsefly landed on her eyeball, took a few steps across her pupil, and rubbed its tiny hands together. Tony felt like one was now crawling on his eye, and he jolted back up and rubbed his eye till the sensation passed. As he looked out the back of the wagon, he saw a thick rope thrown over the banister already in preparation to rid the world of the monster they believed him to be. Surviving in this godforsaken desert before simple modern amenities like plumbing, electricity, or air conditioning was amazing. It is incredible how humans found a way to survive and even thrive here, where there is almost nothing to survive on. It's miraculous to have seen it with my own eyes, Tony sat on the wagon reflecting. Well, technically, they're not your eyes. <laughs> Ionios laughed. Shit, do you know how advanced humanity would be if you all stopped squabbling over your petty differences and fighting over your meaningless ideas on whom God is? Humanity's avarice over wealth, power, or land has caused your kind to burn the halls of knowledge that could have aided them and future civilizations in becoming more modern. They could have discovered something that would have benefited everyone. Your tribe mentality is in effect your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. It's the very reason they slipped a noose over your neck. You have violated the code and have been deemed unworthy to be a part of their tribe. <laughs> Ionio said, chuckling low and cruel. Tony hadn't even realized they had marched him over to the rope. The coarse braids itched against his neck. Dale had already bound Tony's feet and was just about to finish his hands. Well, at least this will be over quick and I'll be on my way to heaven. 
If there is a God, despite him allowing this to happen, he sure can't hold me accountable for your actions. He spoke in a low, flat tone, unaware the words were even coming out. The hell did you just say? Dale yanked the final knot tight, pinching the skin on Tony's wrist. What the hell makes you think you're going to heaven with the shit you've pulled? His nostrils flared in anger, and his eyes turned a storm of rage and disgust. Dale hawked a thick wad of phlegm into his throat and spit into Tony's face. I hope Lucifer grabs your soul and drags it straight to hell. Dale turned away in disgust. He recalled a story on the news that made him feel the way Dale felt about him. Some big shot CEO in New York City was bribing safety engineers to sign off certifications for the elevators in his building. Dude, you're basically in a floating casket if it locks up, he had told the Dell in his time. If the brakes fail or the line snap, you're screwed. That guy deserved to get dragged straight to hell, he thought. Judge Spicer stepped alongside the accused. For the criminal acts of robbery, assault of a minor, and four counts of murder, I hereby sentence you by the power of the great state of Arizona to be hanged by the neck until you are dead, dead, dead. Is there anything you have left to say? Any last words? Tony looked up at the full moon, wondering if heaven lay just beyond it. Like heaven was the dark matter in space he learned about in science. His teacher had said she saw a TV preacher raving that dark matter was the dominion of God, since humans have no clue what it is or what it's made of. She thought it was crap, and he had agreed with her at the time. Now he desperately hoped they were both wrong. I'm sorry for all the trouble I've caused. I could blame it on monsters or demons, but really? The only person for me to blame is me. This town isn't gonna become a great big city, but it's the town too tough to die. Quite the touching speaker you are when it counts, Tony. Ionios' voice clear in his mind. However, I think it's only fair that I warn you. There is no repentance. No God. Surprise. Nope. There is only time. See, when you die... Your soul stays trapped inside your body until it completely decays. Only once every trace of you is gone, does your soul disappear into nothingness. Ionios' cup was overflowing with joy as he unfurled the horrific path that lay in front of Tony. Well, I'm gonna head out and get a splendid view of the show. <laughs> With a convulsive whoosh, Tony felt full control again and full pain. His blown-out knee buckled under the intense wave of pain, and his shoulder throbbed all over again. Judge Spicer gave a nod, and Dale used his horse to pull the rope, lifting Tony free of earth. The rope constricted around his throat, and he could feel the veins in his neck bulge at the same moment his windpipe collapsed. His body flailed wildly, his eyes wide and bulging, taking in every face watching him die. Hey, Tony! A shout from the crowd burst through the chattering. Did she make a believer out of you? Tony saw that strange gleam in the Oriental's owner, Milton Joyce. The voice wasn't his, though. Tony had heard it enough in his head to know it. The Oriental. Did she make a believer out of you? Milton's lips curled into a wicked smile. Tony's eyes rolled back in his head, and he knew by some strange manner that all there would be is darkness. He would be trapped inside the corpse of this man until it disintegrated into nothing. Join 
tales for dark nights.